Hello, everybody. Everybody, hello. Welcome to another Whetstone Wednesday. Uh, the the only Wednesday that is called Whetstone Wednesday. A uh, twice a month stream where I or one of the other uh, four members of Copy That uh, go over and actually review real copy made by real people like yourself. But more specifically, people that are subscribed to uh, patreon.com slash the copy that show here. here this, I'm doing a CTA. This is a CTA. Um, today, we are going to be going over a handful of, of things that were submitted for this particular Wednesday, Whetstone Wednesday review. Uh, we're going to start, however, with it's not really a contest. It's more of a, how should I say, a paid opportunity for people to actually write something that is going to be out there in the real world and be published by us, basically. Uh, more specifically, we have um, uh, several products that are in the Patreon, but we also sell them independently for people that don't want to pay a monthly fee uh, on our website at copythatshow.com. Here, I'm going to I'm going to show you what we got going on. And in particular, right now, anybody who wants to actually write copy for us, the arrangement that I thought would be mutually beneficial would be like, okay, you write for us. If we publish it, we'll pay you $150. This allows you to get paid to make a spec piece that you are free to put into your portfolio. And you'll get feedback on these Whetstone Wednesdays so that, you know, you can actually punch stuff up. There are some restrictions. Those are all in the, the Discord, which should be uh, linked in the description or elsewhere in our channel. You are free to check those out. Um, but uh, mas o menos, if you want to write for Copy That uh, and get paid for it, you absolutely can. You just have to have access to the things that you want to write for. And uh, yeah, if you do that, uh, we'll pay you. We've actually already paid uh, three copywriters for their work. Um, and these are the types of pages that we need product descriptions for. So like, for example, we have a really good one for this particular masterclass. And you can kind of see the format, kind of like what we're expecting and what we're hunting for. Uh, but what we're lacking is a, a copy for ones like this. There you go. And so effectively, essentially, if you would like a chance to get paid and get feedback from us on something that is actually going to be published out there in the world, we're giving you a chance to do it. So that is that. That's the sort of like groundwork for what we're going to be discussing today. Um, I have a few uh, comments in the chat. Uh, hello. How is it going? What is up? How was your day? Uh, my day has been good, productive, busy. Uh, I took two or three days off of working out and uh, did a brutal leg workout today. And so uh, stairs, stairs are abysmal right now. Oh, I'll just say that. Um, but yeah, uh, very, very productive. Uh, how was your day? Uh, you are not alone here on, on YouTube. Uh, other people are there. Hello. So um, let us jump right into it. Uh, we're going to start with the actual, um, how should I say, product descriptions that I've just been talking about. So I'm going to change my screen to the little mini me. And we are going to start with this first one. Now, uh, the copywriter who wrote this, the, one of the stipulations for this particular arrangement, you know, you write copy for our product descriptions, we pay you money, is it's first come, first serve. You know, like it's the fairest way that we can figure it out. What I effectively said also was, uh, if you like do this and it's just clearly better, uh, just much better copy than what we have published from a previous person who won, we'll still pay you and we'll publish that. The reason why we would not split test these is because none of these are landing pages. All of these are product descriptions. So we would not want to drive traffic to these. These exist so that people who are going through our website, who are uh, you know perusing and browsing and going through the catalog of things that we've published, um, just simply have more reasons to buy the thing. And so if part of our marketing strategy was paying to drive traffic to these pages, it would make financial sense to split test these and determine which one would win. But uh, depending, like for most products, especially info products, it just doesn't really make financial sense 
to actually pay to drive traffic to them. Um, you know, I could be wrong. People might have other, uh, you know, different experiences. But what I've found generally, especially with info, is you want to like actually send people to something that is more like a sales letter or a sales page rather than a product description. Uh, Constantinos, hello. What is up? Um, so that all being said, let's actually zoom in on this and look at this. So this particular piece of product description copy, uh, it was written for something that we actually just, just got copy for this particular page. And right off the bat, one of the things that I want to draw attention to, and this is actually a problem for all of the submissions for this that I've gotten so far, is that a product page tends to have a pretty specific structure and format. Image, image, and then over here, a sort of like pocket of teasery bullets and like, you know, what the benefits actually are, like why would you would want to continue uh, reading? Hold on. Uh, did you hit Bulgarian split squats in your leg workout today? No, I, I actually, so I modified back squats so that my heels were super elevated. Uh, and like, I got like crazy depth and range of motion. And I, you know, I have a torn meniscus in my knee. So it was like dodgy and I had to like really lower the weight, but I really upped the reps and it was just, uh, it was just terrible. Anywho. So yeah, th this bullets, bullets that tease people and, and basically go, Hey, you, th th here's the benefit to buying this. Here's why you would want to learn more about it, et cetera, et cetera. And it basically just gives the sort of details, you know, right up front. And this is lacking that sort of obviously the other one that I got is sorry, not this one. Uh, this one, uh, this one has it, but I want to go over something really quick. Look up most Amazon product pages or any product page in general. Look at this, a watch, gold plated, probably watch. What do you see? Bullet, 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 bullet. This is effectively the same thing. And it's down here that you actually get more product description, that you actually see in more detail the reasons why you would want to buy it. Now, that's for watches. And you're like, oh, you know, like nobody uses bullets anymore. Bullets are ridiculous. Let's let's pull up diapers, huggies, diapers, little movers. And what do we see at the top of the product description? Hold on. There we go. Bullet, 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 bullet. You got to write bullets for this portion of a product description. Not every page has them, but in terms of actually abiding by what clients are looking for and, you know, fitting into the trappings of this particular genre or type of copywriting, you always want a little very tight, very concisely written, very, very punchy series of bullets that just clearly say, this is what this is. This is why it's beneficial to you. This is why you want to do more. So there you go. And so that's the first thing that I identify as being wrong with this. It's missing that altogether. Now, reading this, let's just look at the copy. Outperform 99% of copywriters by mastering product pages. We can look at this in terms of the four U's. Four U's are useful, ultra specific, unique, and urgent. Now, let me ask you guys, all of you watching right now, do you feel like this is useful? Maso menos. Yeah. If you are desiring to outperform other copywriters, yeah, this could be useful to you. But how about, well, let me rephrase that question. How many people out there have in their head as they're learning copywriting, man, what I really want to do is outperform other copywriters. That's not what I'm thinking of when I wake up in the morning. Okay, great. How about ultra specificity? Eh, maso menos. I mean, we are talking about, of course, product pages. 99% is not a very specific number, just kind of an arbitrarily high number. 
but yeah, there's some specificity there. I wouldn't call this ultra specific. Like for example, if you were to drop this into any other page about teaching copywriters how to write product pages, can you say with certainty that this headline would not apply to any other business or any other situation or any other course? Uh, that's where things get a little sticky. Um, and I just pausing for a moment, I'm, I focus a lot on headlines and headline copy because here's the thing with headlines. When you write a headline, you are spending 80 cents out of your dollar, as David Ogilvy once said, I think. Um, if people read the headline and aren't interested, they're not going to read the rest. You know, you could have the best copy on the planet. You could have the best offer on the planet. People don't like the headline, the, the thing that they first see. They're not going to scroll down. So that's why it's always worth really dialing in your headlines, your subheads, the things that people see, what, what's called above the fold, like when they first land on the page. Now, I want you to compare this headline to the headline that we actually published, the thing that we paid for. Master the little known copywriting skill that can earn you $450, $750, or even $1,000 plus dollars per page. Let me ask you about that. Useful? I would say yes. How about unique? Both of these are lacking on the uniqueness territory. How about ultra specificity? I would say where this one wins is in the ultra specificity department. Because not only is it enticing people to read more, you know, people are going to read this and be like, oh, you know, product pages, I don't need to know that. But what do people actually want? People want money. And here's the thing. By doing it this way, we're not promising, hey, you'll become a, you know, high in demand copywriter, you know, you know getting a Bugatti and stuff like that. It's a reasonable, pro you know, uh, promise based on pricing ranges that are actually out there in the world at like actual pricing schedules that people get paid. So it is a reasonable promise to make. So, yeah, specific numbers, specific quantities, and the 99% looks clickbait. I'm OK with clickbait, like, you know. It's just kind of the world that we live in. My problem with 99% is, let me put it to you this way. What do you feel like is a more believable number? 99% or 87.2%? That specificity, it's that specificity that really puts stuff over the edge. Even if we're talking about a, like a worse outcome or a worse number, Specificity makes something more believable. And if something is more believable, they are more likely to pay attention to you. And attention in copywriting is absolutely the name of the game. So, yeah, 87.2. Absolutely. And that, that's just a, a factor of human psychology. And in fact, like, one of the things that I did early in my career, um, I had a a product that I was writing for and two or three of the gains were like exactly 100% on the dot, like exactly 100%. And I asked the legal department, like, Hey, is it okay if I change this number so that it's actually less than a hundred percent, like actually like promise people less than this. And they were like, yeah, sure. You know, like, you know, better to like, you know, recast or rejigger something and have it be better, like when you have to like actually show proof of this, um, than otherwise. And so, you know, I, instead of a hundred percent wrote like 97%, 92%, 95%, something along those lines. So are there certain numbers proved to work better? So here's the thing. Uh, they constantly are doing studies about this and what they find is They'll do a study, they'll say, hey, these numbers have specific psychological significance, then everybody uses those numbers, and then those numbers stop working so well. It's a complex adaptive system. But what I've found is that people tend to find less believable things that are divisible by fives and tens. You know, people just assume that it's like made up. Um, also, like commonly used numbers like 99. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind. So. I'm going to choose the headline that we currently have. Now, let's actually look at the copy. 
you probably have no idea how to write product pages and that's all right. So we're absolving people of their, you know, shortcomings. It's way harder than just putting some pretty sounding words on a page. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Let's stop here. What do you guys think of this opening? Opening of any sort of, you know, longish form piece of copy, you have one, maybe two sentences to actually convince a person to keep reading and be enticed. Who's enticed? Who's excited? Who's reading these four sentences? Be like, oh, product pages. Yeah. Yes. Let's compare that with what we have published. You don't need to be a master of persuasion to be an in-demand e-commerce copywriter. All you need is to make it easy for customers to say yes to buying something they already know they want. Holy shit, right? Holy shit. Two sentences, and I don't even know what this is yet, but I'm like, yeah, yeah, because what's going on here? You know, as, as you know, my friend Kyle Milligan would say, like, this makes it feel easy. This makes it feel reasonably safe. This feels like I'm getting a leg up. Whereas this, what's the subtext here? You know, it's way harder. You know, what's, listen, writing product pages, not the easiest thing in the world. We are actually looking at product page copy right now. It's not super simple. But here's the thing. All you need to do is make it easy for customers to say yes to buying something they already know they want. Now, here's the thing. Notice the way that that's phrased. It's not saying that it's easy, but it makes it feel like it's easy. And that makes all of the difference. That's powerful. So, yeah. And then also, like the other copy, you belittle your reader without providing a certain promise of how you're going to help. Two intriguing sentences. Absolutely. And so, yeah. Uh, intrigue, it's important. You know, making sure that you're effectively making something feel if not easy, at least seem like it's simple. You know, uh, you can say something is simple, but not easy. And that's totally okay. But what I think is going on here, and what I think is going on more powerfully here, is that it's communicating all those subtle emotions more subtly here. It's letting the reader come to their own conclusions. And, you know, that's, that's what I mean when I talk about emotional writing. So, If you really want to get good at writing product pages that convert, you'll need to forget everything you know about copywriting. 99% mm, of copywriters fail because they don't understand this. Mm, what do you guys think? For me, you know, I appreciate a good hyperbole every now and then, out now and again. You know, you have to do like this. You have to. This is the best. This. This is this. Um, but I'm very cautious of hollow hyperbole. Things where, if you think about it for more than three point eight seconds, you go, "Wait, what? Really? Really? Yeah." And so, ultimately, like. Yes, the, sent the subtext of the sentence, what it's trying to do is go, hey, you need this course because your copywriting skills are not going to help you here. Yeah, that, that can work in some situations. But it's not true, you know? And I had a copywriting mentor many years ago. Um, not really a mentor. He, he was just above me and taught me a few things about copywriting. Um, he said this very simply. Don't say it if it's not true. If it's not true, change the copy. And so, you know, if you compare that to how this continues, just doing this is enough to give you a line of clients that can't wait to work with you. Clearly benefit driven, clear, clearly beneficial. Of course, knowing how to make it easy to say yes isn't as straightforward as it sounds. Look at that twist. 
you know, without making it seem like it's super hard or that you have to abandon your principles, like we're including a complication here, just a little tease. It took the marketing director, Alex Mayat, years of trial and error, with tens of thousands of dollars in ad spend to figure out the best practices for e-commerce product pages. Look at what that's doing. That's called anchoring. It's literally making this product subconsciously feel more valuable than just a 100 minute video. When you say something like this, it's like, um, uh, what is that, Katamari? Uh, where it's like this rolling thing that picks up other uh, subtextual meanings along the way. Um, by saying this, that 100 minute video now becomes in the mind of the prospect a accumulation, a combination of years of mistakes, years of learning what works, tens of thousands of dollars of value to get these best practices. That's how the logic of copy works. You know, you're saying stuff like this that's factual, but the subtext is adding that subconscious value to the actual product. So that I think is pretty cool. And notice how every single sentence of, of this copy is actually like doing something subtextually that's adding to the froth of desire that the prospect might have. You know, subtly addressing objections like this without saying it's hard and you're going to have to forget everything that you've ever learned about copywriting to this point. Stuff like that. Also, it aims to people that already know something about copy. So they feel might feel a bit off with that hyperbole. Yeah, absolutely. I am. Um, yeah, I'm going to make a video about this at some point in the near future, but the copywriting world is barbell shaped. And I don't mean in terms of like people that populate either end of the market. I mean, in terms of the amount of money to be made. And the amount of money to be made is either in people that have a lot of money, but there's not very many of them. And these are the people that go to like, you know, Nashville for Copy Chief Live and things like that, or, you know, events and other things, you know, digital marketer events. And then there's this wide swath of a lot of people with not very much money, but in aggregate, they have a lot of money. And one of the things that I don't want to be in the business in is in taking the money, like taking money from desperate people. That for me is, it's icky. I don't like it. And the problem is that the people in that, on that side of the barbell, they are very willing to part with their money on something that won't necessarily help them. You know, something that promises them that they'll be able to achieve a dream, but is completely divorced from actual practicality. Which, you know, like if you want to be like a successful copywriter and you have bad morals, like go for it. You know, attack the wannabes, promise them the moon. There you go. person is using Stripsy style of this, never giving it away and enticing the reader to read on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it makes the person see more than the 100 minutes because they fantasize themselves in that position. Absolutely correct. You know, it's, you know, you're not just buying a 100 minute video, you're buying years of experience, years of A-B testing. So this isn't really doing that. You know, I don't feel like we're, how should I say, boosting the implied or perceived value of the product at this point. Why aren't the percentages of success of something count as testimonials shouldn't be exact and able to be proven? Um, please recast your question. I'm not sure I understand. Anyway. So, and then we're pulling in a little bit of intrigue. I, so here's the thing. You know, I don't think that this is quite working. Um, one of the big issues is it feels like it doesn't flow. You know, you probably have no idea how to write product pages. That's all right. It's way harder than just, you know, pretty the words a page. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. If you really want to get good at writing product pages that convert, you'll need to forget everything you know about copywriting. 99% of copywriters fail because they don't understand this. And this, I assume, means what's on the slide. And then Alex Mayat, our presenter, will teach you how to get ahead of your competition and stay within that 1% that converts buyers. 
you know, that's just not, it's not working for, it's not grabbing me by the short and curlies, as someone might say. Um, whereas this, you know, I knew from the first few lines that it was working pretty well and that it was emotionally written and it was evocative and it was intriguing and it was beneficial. You know, it checked all of my boxes, so to speak. So I'm just going to skip this, the, the lead, it's not really working. We'll just go to a couple of bullets. Um, here. Here's a detailed insight of what you can expect from this video. And then what follows is specific bullets. The difference between a landing page, product page, and a sales page, and why they are all the same thing. So question mark. Um, let's compare that with this. Become an instant e-commerce expert. Alex defines the three terms you need to know to confidently handle a sales call with a client. You'll always sound like a professional, whether your clients are marketing experts or not. If you had to weigh the two bullets, the one that is, you know, the, the challenger awaits versus the incumbent that we have selected, which do you pick, one or two? So it's this versus this. And I'll try to zoom in so people can see a little bit better. Don't everybody answer all at once. You can just write a one or two in the chat. One or two. I mean, you can just write three if you don't want to answer, but you want to tell me that you're still alive and breathing. And I don't need to call the paramedics on you. Second, second, second. Got one, one. Interesting. Three, you're still alive. Thank you for letting me know. Okay. So wh why is... Why is this not really working and why is this working? We can use the four U's to assess bullets as well. Unique, ultra specific, urgent, useful. Now, how many people, again, just watching out there in the world, and I know I make this joke a lot, how many people wake up and go, God damn, I wish I knew the difference between landing pages and product pages and sales pages. Not, not a whole lot of people. So we have to question the usefulness of that, the utility. How many people are constantly fretting over whether or not the same thing? And also, doesn't it give away a little bit of the information in the video when you say, why are they all the same thing? You basically say like, hey, these are all the same thing. And then I no longer need to know the difference. So how about this? Become an instant e-commerce expert again. OK, desirable, cool. Defines the three terms you need to know. OK, intriguing. And it's specific. It's three terms. To confidently handle a sales call with a client. Oh, a specific outcome. And also, it's useful. How? How many of you have like fretted or worried about like, oh my God, am I actually going to have to like talk to clients on the phone and like make myself sound as though I were competent and confident and like won't fuck it up? A lot of you probably. And so, yeah, there's baked in demand there. You will always sound like a professional, whether your clients are marketing experts or not. Look at that. That's so good. It's good copy. That's a good bullet. So there you go. This right here, uh, it's kind of falling flat on a lot of the use. Um, <laughs> the difference between the landing pages uh, apparently keeps uh, Mad Proper up at night. So I, you know, I'm sorry. Um, weird. <laughs> it's a little weird, but you know, all good. You do you, man. So yeah. Let's look at this one uh, and let's just sort of skip down. 
learn how to crush any objections your customers may have. Get their trust. Okay, beneficial. Let's compare that to 5452. Do we have a, oh, same moment. Okay, so this bullet is about the exact same moment down to the second that this other copywriter is referring to. So first one that we're going to assess. Number one, learn how to crush any objections your customers may have, get their trust. Okay, that's one. How about two? How top copywriters knock out all of a reader's objections in one spot. This trade secret wins over even the most indecisive customers. Oof. One or two. So this is two. This is one. Learn how to crush any objections your customers may have. Get their trust. Put a one if you really like this bullet. Or number two. How top copywriters knock out all of a reader's objections in one spot. This trade secret wins over even the most indecisive customers. And that's two. 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 You think one. Interesting. I'd love to hear the reasoning for that. I would definitely agree with two. Two. So what's going on here? Learn how to crush any objections your customers may have. Get their trust. Eh. Eh. You know, it's... You're using a good verb here. Crush any objections. Reasonably strong. I would give this bullet maybe a C or C+. Plus. Like, there's potential here. But compare that to this. How top copywriters... Okay. Instant social proof. Knock out another great verb or verb phrase, all of a reader's objections in one spot. Okay. So it feels like this is, uh, you know, seven in one stroke, a single thing that you can do to basically knock out a ton of different problems that your copy might have to contend with. So, you know, there's the implication that it's simple, that it's, you know, easy, that it's powerful. You know, there's a, a lot going on there that's subtextual as opposed to this, which is, you know, what's the subtext? And not a lot. This trade secret, intrigue, wins over, another great verb phrase, even the most indecisive customers. So look at that. So rather than the benefit, get their trust, which like, you know, that's not a very specific benefit. This, this is a very specific group of people that this trade secret can win over. The implication, of course, being that your sales will go up because you're able to reach even more people than you otherwise would just simply by crushing objections. Yeah. So two, there's strong intrigue with trade secrets and how it will slash any problems that will come up in the near future. Absolutely. So... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to vote for the incumbent as well here too. So uh, I don't want to, I don't want to pile on or, um, you know, one thing, let's see, ask, ask, ask. Uh, for a second, I thought that these were testimonials, but they are not. If, if you have an opportunity ever to include social proof, you absolutely should. Where can social proof come from? It can come from the comments of the actual videos posted in Patreon. Uh, it can come from what people are saying in the Discord. It, you can literally, anybody who joins the Discord and wants to write one of these and get 150 bucks, you can just go in and to exclusive chat and just ask people like, hey, you know, did you see this? What did you think? Like, what was, what did you, what was your honest opinion? And then bingo, bango, all of a sudden you have testimonials that you can include in your product pages. It's that simple. They're like, I, I, don't, I don't feel like I needed to give you permission to do this, but you have permission to do this. So um, that, that, that is what I, I'm going to say about this particular product page. We have a couple more that uh, to look at and that we will go through. Let's look specifically at this one. So... Now, here we have, this is the teaser, headline, body copy, bullets. Okay. All right, all right, all right. So let's look at this one. 
in this, and this one is for this, this product in particular, we didn't have copy for it and we needed it. So we're willing to pay for it. In this 40 minute masterclass, you'll learn how to go beyond the surface of copy and truly grasp its hidden messages, learning exactly step-by-step -step how to analyze any piece of copy. Copy That Show host Rod Satterwhite lays out a framework that delves into the literal, structural, and conceptual aspects of studying copy, valuable to both newbie copywriters and those with more experience under their belt. What do you all think of that? Compare that to this right here. What do you think? This? So here's what I think. In my opinion, a lot of this copy is doing what this stuff is already doing which means that you're using up valuable real estate to duplicate information. No bueno. This one, it doesn't really speak to any actual desires that the prospect has. Like, look at this. Product pages are an overlooked way for newbie copywriters to build their portfolio and get paid well for doing it. That's two major benefits specifically for a specific person. That's pretty cool. Whereas here, you know, I don't see what the implied benefit is. Like, yeah, there are definitely some people that want to learn exactly step by step how to analyze a piece of copy. Great. We call them nerds. I am one of them. But, you know, most nerds, like, they're not going to be your biggest buyers. You have to tell people and show people what the benefit is to them. Like, why? Why do I want to analyze copy? You know, most people, when they're searching for copywriting information and products, they're looking for things that can get them gigs. They don't even care about writing copy that much. They just are like, they, they're like, oh, copywriting? How do I learn outreach? It, there's nothing in between. Like, they just go straight from one to the other. Like, they don't even bother to learn how to write well. And so... You know, this, it, there's not really a whole lot of baked in demand. You know, there's not a whole lot of things that grab me, that really grip me and emotionally, like, attach to me. Like, there, this is interesting, the literal, structural, and conceptual aspects of studying copy. But what does that mean? You know, like, why is that going to be intriguing to somebody if they don't understand, like, what those even are? So, yeah, one of the things here, it needs bullets. Absolutely. You know, we went over like, you know, two different kinds of products with Amazon product page copy. You need to, you need to know how to write bullets, especially for this little teaser text. Now, for this, bullets are valuable. And focusing in this on being benefit driven, I think, is going to help you a lot. So <laughs> see, see, like that, that, this is what I was talking about. People don't commonly ask questions about how to write copy. Well, they go straight for outreach. That's exactly what they want to know. So the doc feels like it talks about the features more than benefits. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the sort of flat features. And listen, like, you know, you have to know how to write features enticingly as well. There's actually four things, and this is not commonly discussed, and most people don't make YouTube videos about it because it won't scale very well. But there's four things that you need to know how to write well in terms of, like, actually writing an evocative and enticing copy. You need to know how to write a good feature, like how to spin, like, you know, the fact that a pencil remains sharp into something that is, you know, compelling and enticing. And then there's advantages, like what makes something better than something else. And then there's benefits, like how it fulfills a desire. And then there's deeper benefits, which is how it fulfills some like deeper core emotional desire. 
Um, you know, like for example, there's a difference between the benefit of this product will help you make a lot of money versus this product will help you make a lot of money, which could save your marriage, which will make you, you know, a hero to your children, which will make you the envy of your neighbors. You know, those are deeper benefits. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about that. Yeah, this is very feature driven. God, I wish I knew the literal constructual and conceptual aspects of studying coffee. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's you know, you can't imagine a person really saying that in seriousness, which is why this is ultimately not really working as something that's designed to sort of stoke the coals of desire and get a person to read and learn more. So literal structure, yeah, it sounds like a robot. Can I teach? you good copy for successful outreach listen click off of this go to youtube.com slash copy that go to the live tab if you scroll down there is a video called how to become a successful copywriter in 2023 or something along those lines we not only talk about what's going on in marketing and how to succeed but we also talk about some of the best modes of outreach that you can use today it's like a four hour long conversation. We answer a ton of questions at the end. And listen, if you want to know how to do outreach, we got the resources for you, man. Like we got tons of stuff to help you. It's all there. It is all free. All right. So let's move on to the headline. Oh, hold on. We got a quick question. Do you have any book recommendations or any type of info that can teach somebody teach that can teach how to smoothly transition from hook to body? Book transitions, book recommendations specifically for transitions. Um, so, no, I don't have any book recommendations specifically for that. What I do have for you is uh, just a suggestion. Read a lot of copy and see how they do it. Uh, and what you want to do is you want to say like, okay, this is making a transition from like hook to body copy. What is it doing? Now, what you can do is create a little Word doc and just copy paste the text that they are using. And then you would give that type of transition a name. You know, you can say like, um, you know, I know you, you can say something like, I know you're skeptical, but just give me a moment and I will prove to you how dot, dot, dot. And then that's your subhead. That's how you transition from hook to body. And then what you can do is label that type of transition Hey, this is like this would be an example of, and then just name it whatever you want. You could call that the, I don't know, the skepticism killer transition. And then you do that for like 38 pieces of copy, maybe 50. And as you compile this long list of transitions, you're going to come up with other categories, different things that they're doing to accomplish the same goal. And then all of a sudden, you have this robust swipe file that nobody else on the planet has of like, different transitions you can use for different purposes. That's how, that's how you build up a swipe file. That's how you learn how to do this stuff. So, oh, and how to write the body copy without waffling and wasting words. Um, we'll do a video about that in the future. I don't want to distract from this stream. You know, I have a limited amount of time and I want to keep the focus on the copy we're focusing on. Yeah. Literal, structural, and conceptual also feels like it could be dumbed down a lot. I wouldn't use the term dumbed down, but I would definitely use the term simplified. Um, and the reason why seventh grade, sixth grade writing works so well is because what I have found, what we have found really over the course of our careers is that if you write a very highfalutin style of copy, you maybe have a chance to get somebody that understands the words that you're using, that has a very, how should I say, uh, intellectual, basically. Somebody who understands a word like sesquipedalian or you know whatever that means. However, what we've also found is that if you write simpler, like geared more towards like somebody with a fifth or sixth grade reading level, well, guess what happens? Not only do you still have a chance to capture an intellectual, but you have a chance to capture everybody else as well. So what would you rather do? like write in such a way that only, you know, somebody with a PhD can understand you. And even then you only have a fraction of a chance to like actually convert them. Or would you rather write more simply and be able to appeal to everybody? Know the answer. 
Anywho, <laughs> highfalutin, adding that to a list of new words. Yeah, it's, I, I know. So let's look at this headline. This three-step framework is the fastest way that literally anyone can kickstart their copywriting career. Okay. We clearly have some usefulness. Kickstarting a copywriting career. Cool. We have a thing. Three-step framework. It's unique. It feels unique. It feels ultra specific. The it here's the thing. When I say unique, I mean like it's sort of a little different from what other other people are saying, but like what makes this like truly unique? Like, give this a name. Is do we have a name? You know, does Rod use a name throughout the entire masterclass? This three-step, I don't know, squiddly spooch framework. And then squiddly spooch is like, it could just be anything. It could be like just a variable you just plug things into. But what that does is by naming it, by systematizing it and making it feel proprietary, that helps you make it feel not only unique, but also very specific to what this is and what this product is. So I'm not saying use the word squiddly spooch in your copy. I'm saying that like squiddly spooch is a variable and you can plug anything into that variable. Ideally something that is used in the actual fulfillment. So the three-step highfalutin framework, <laughs> Jesus Christ, is the fastest way. So we have a clear benefit. It's fast, okay? That literally anyone, so it feels easy, can kickstart their career. And that's the benefit. Um, I don't hate this. Uh, but it can definitely be punched up. And I think where it can be punched up is in the uniqueness department and in the ultra specificity department. Because that literally anyone, you're not narrowing down your demographic. And one thing that I've learned from my years as a marketer is that if you try to target any, like everyone, you will effectively target no one. So call somebody out, call a specific person out. And what you'll find is that even people that are not in that demographic will still respond to it. Um, and they'll respond to it better than saying literally anyone, because kind of like what I was saying before about 99% of copywriters, not everybody's people are not going to believe literally anyone can do this. So hyper specificity, target somebody, and then three step framework, give it something proprietary, proprietary that Rod actually says. Um, and here's the thing. You don't even need to like come up with the word or like make something up. You have L S C the three-step LSC framework. There you go. That's all you need to do. So now here's why I would not use this. I would never use this. I don't want to ever promise people that 10K. Now this, the implication here, like, yes, it's beneficial and people are going to respond to it, but it's also writing a check that we cannot cash. The vast majority of people, the vast majority of people that are learning copywriting will not kickstart their career to 10, 10K. They just won't. And so for that reason, you know, we, the people that copy that, tend to stay away from those kinds of promises. So. Yeah day one copywriters, you know, three, the three, the simple, uh, three step or just the three step because three steps is already Im implying simple. The street three step LSC framework, um, is the fastest way that, you know, day one copywriters can kickstart their career. Yeah, I can see that working. I can see that working a person who wrote this definitely, uh, you know, consider that noodle around with it really dial in this headline. So, Headline is find direct benefit. It's a safe course, anyone, but could be more specific. Yeah, I would say specificity is going to punch this up. Definitely works, but I don't know if it works for the copy that's less aggressive, realistic copy promises. Yeah, that's that's my thing. Yeah, juniors, but here's the thing. Juniors, copy juniors, uh, it's very specific. And somebody that's new to this world might not understand like implicitly what a junior copywriter is or what that means. Some won't even put it into action and then uh, complain that, you know, we didn't get what you promised. Yeah, absolutely. I My big thing with promises is that I think it's a slippery slope. And ultimately, what you have to do to sell a promise effectively ensures that 
you are always going to have a huge amount of people that are dissatisfied with whatever they get from you. And I would rather just be upfront with people and be like, this is what you get. This, this is the God's honest truth. Like, here's all the information you need to make an informed decision about buying. I mean, of course, be like enticing, be exciting, be fascinating, be enthusiastic, but also give people enough that they can make a decision without having to like pull at their, how should I say, exploit their hopes, dreams, and aspirations. Okay. We've got a question. When you are rewriting copy for a prospect as spec work and don't know much about the product, do you only use the words that are in the copy already? Do you add things you don't know are mentioned? Um, I, this is a challenging question, but for me in the past when I've here, I'll, I'll move my face, I guess. Um, in the past, when I've had to do something like that, I buy the product, you know, I use the product. And so one of the things that I do when I rewrite, you know, something that exists or something that already has copy for it is I sort of come up with my own ideas about what to write about. And so if you don't, if you can't do that, if you, you know, don't have the ability to do that, I would not recommend just making something up. You're going to have to either rely on the copy that already exists, or alternatively, you're going to have to like look and see what other people are saying about the product, either in product reviews, or just in casual conversation forums and things like that. Promises are cool. If you say you're a pizza chain that has stats backing up, its average delivery time is under 30 minutes. Yeah, exactly. If you can back up a promise, that is absolutely something you should do. Promise things that you can deliver on. I can't promise that people are going to achieve a $10,000 a month in copywriting. I, I can't and I won't. So is it possible? Yes, of course it's possible. Is it a reasonable expectation? I mean, I think people should go for it. I think people should be unreasonable in their expectations if they're ambitious. But also, I'm not going to be like, yes, yes, everybody gets 10K. I am Oprah. You know, that's ridiculous. Then you can promote something guaranteeing pizza free, knowing nine attempts you can deliver. Absolutely. Also, I want to offer email newsletter writing services, but I'm struggling to come up with an offer. Can you give me some insights? Um, yeah, uh, reach out to businesses that would benefit from that. Like, for example, dog treats. Dog treats don't really need a newsletter. You know, like make sure that you snipe businesses that would benefit from a newsletter and make sure one of two things. Uh, they don't have one. So you can sell them on the benefits of having an engaging newsletter or two, they have one, but it sucks. And then show some examples of what you can do to make it better uh, using the best principles of newsletter writing, whatever those may be. Maybe we'll do a masterclass about that one day. Um, so, you know, in terms of specific offers, you know, specific offers are what? They're a specific solution, they're a specific outcome, they're a specific time frame, they're new and novel packaging, and then there's some sort of risk reversal involved. And so, like, for example, you know, a specific solution would be, hey, you know, I would like to write newsletters for you. Like, I, you know, we can start with just me doing five. You know, that's specific. You know, specific outcome is, like, I guarantee that your deliverability and your click-through rates are going to go up on your marketing list or in the links that are in the newsletters. So you can have some sort of specific promise there if you can deliver. Um, and like the promise can be as simple as like, I, I can beat what you're currently doing. You know, that, that's, you don't have to like promise, like I'm going to get you 80%, you know, click-through rates and stuff like that. You know, that's ridiculous. You're not going to succeed. So, you know, just say you're going to beat the control. Uh, specific time frame, you know, if you know the number of newsletters you're going to write, that tells you the number of weeks that you would write for them. And then packaging, like, you know, does every business know or want a newsletter? You know, some people might think that like, oh, newsletter, that's boring. That's old. That's for boomers. Um, and so newsletter, you might want to repackage as like, you know, engagement emails or something like that. Um, you know, just think about and sort of noodle around in your mind different ways that you can frame newsletters or like why they would be beneficial to a business and then risk reversal like, and you know what, if I don't succeed in beating the control, then, you know, like either I'll do it for cheap or for free or whatever. I generally recommend people don't work for free, but if it gets your foot in the door and establishes a relationship, I am also a firm believer and fan 
of taking less than what you expect or what you would want to demand in order to establish that relationship that can then go on to pay dividends over time. So hopefully that helps. There you go. Yes, this this feels a little bit more specific. Boost. I don't I don't know if boost is the right verb there. I would have to noodle around with that and think about it. Insurance agents love newsletters. Oh my God. Uh, accountants do too. Oh my Lord, do they love it. Uh, so CFPs, CPAs, you know, uh, any sort of accountant or bookkeeper, like they, they love engaging their list with newsletters. Um, on that 10K offer, can we add a disclaimer section after offer like? I mean, yeah. So like for, for example, uh, I write in a field that is extremely restrictive in terms of compliance and what sorts of claims that you can make. And one of the things with disclaimers is that they must be clear, they must be prominent, and they must be proximal. So let me ask you this. Do you think that this copy would be powerful if you said the three-step framework that will get you to 10K months, and then right below that, you had slightly bigger text that said, we can't actually promise you 10K months? Like, that's, that's ridiculous. That's stupid. Like So, like, why not just write better and not rely on something lazy like a 10K promise? So. <laughs> Results may vary. Yeah, there you go. Anyway, so I sorry for getting on the compliance train, but, like, one day I'm going to make a video about compliance. It's going to get, like, 37 views, you know, and it's going to completely scuttle, copy that's, like, channel growth because like the algorithm is just going to be like nobody wants to watch what they're publishing um but all 37 of those people are going to know how to write really good compliant copy I, l let me tell you what all right so let's get into the the body copy so uh, l this scrap it rewrite it this has promise punch it up let's get into the actual lead the fastest way to become a better copywriter is to find copy that's already working, reverse engineer it, and then remix it for your own purposes. Okay. Coming straight out of the gate. Um, do you have any, uh, recommend any sites for learning powerful verbs and bullets? Um, the thesaurus.com? Possibly? Uh, gosh. Yeah, uh, look up, um, see if you can find either trigger words or emotional power words online. Because if you can find a list of those, you'll find, you know, a list of, you know, substitutions that you can make to make your writing more engaging and emotional. It is, yeah, this, this first sentence, it feels like it's giving away the farm. So, you know, like compare that to this. You don't need to be a master of persuasion to be an in-demand e-commerce copywriter. All you need is to make it easy for customers to say yes to buying something that they already know they want. We're not giving away the farm. We're not revealing what this is yet, but it feels beneficial. It feels enticing. It feels easy. Okay. This, I don't hate it. It's not terrible. Let's go on. But do you want to know the real problem most newbie copywriters have? They just don't know how to read copy. They think they understand it. They think they understand how copywriting works. But in all likelihood, they've never actually sat down and thought about the process of reading copy as well as writing it. Yeah, I I feel like this, this would be better if it came a little later. If it came after something a little bit more enticing, a little bit more um, interesting, a little bit more fascinating. Um, the term that comes immediately to mind is what Eugene Schwartz calls gradualization. Um, a lot of copy works uh, because it is effectively a slow strip tease with words. And good copy is able to make that slow strip tease really interesting and provocative rather than boring. Um, by just coming out of the gate and being like, this is a thing, you know, this is a thing that is going, you know, that we know to be true. So automatically from sentence one, we're already losing some of the people that do not already have that notion, that don't already believe that notion. 
So, you know, that's a problem. And then right away, we have a rhetorical question, which rhetorical questions are fine for enabling gradualization and, you know, like making things last a little bit longer. Um, they just don't know how to read copy. Now, imagine that you're the type of person who's a copywriter. I've worked with, been around, and managed copywriters for about 10 years at this point. And one thing I can say about copywriters is, on the whole, they tend to be pretty arrogant. They tend to be smug. It's just, it's a common denominator among copywriters. And so one of the things that you need to be careful about when you say stuff like this is, if I came up to you and I said, you know what your fucking problem is? You don't know how to fucking read. That person's gonna be like, what the hell? No! You know, they're, they're immediately going to have a like, a whiplashed effect. Uh, 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 it's just not going to be, how should I say? It's not going to be effective for really enticing and like luring them in and like helping segue into, you know, the discussion that you want to have. You can say this stuff, it's fine, but it needs to be couched. You need to enter it gently before you just come out and basically imply that copywriters are illiterate, which by the way, we all know that they are. Like, I'm not disagreeing with this point. What I'm saying is you have to soften the blow. All the people that are watching right now, like, you know, I'm sorry, none of us know how to read. None of us, we're copywriters, we're not copy readers. So that's a big thing. Yeah, nobody wants to hear you are the problem. So, you know, even in an applied way, that's problematic. So what else? Um, you know, the farm, velvet pouch. Yeah, absolutely. You know, keep it, keep it hidden and like draw excitement about it. So that's a, that's a thing. Uh, that, that's my big problem with this particular opening. And what, what I'm trying to say is like, word for word, you can keep this. It's not bad copy but it's missing a lot of stuff that would come before it. So, the truth is, in every piece of copy, there are hidden messages that are orchestrated behind the scenes. Ooh, fascinating. I, you might have buried the lead here a little bit, buddy. When you can actually start spotting them is when things really click. Eh, you lost me you'll finally be able to write copy that doesn't just fill space, but copy that, hey, he said the words, but copy that sparks some action, getting you results needed to succeed in this game. Here's what I don't like about these three sentences. When you close your eyes, and please, I welcome you to close your eyes and, and listen and listen to my deep voice. Close your eyes and imagine what your life is like when things really click. Imagine, just imagine for a moment what life is like when your copy sparks some action and gets you the results that you need to succeed in this game. Just imagine what that looks like to you. And then open your eyes and please tell me, like explain to me what you saw because I don't know what it is. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, what does that look like? You know, and that that was a, a sort of humorous, like mildly, like gently teasing way of pointing out like this. It's using cliches is what I'm trying to say. It's using hollow language. I prefer the other copy voice, not my ASMR voice. OK, um, like what, what does it mean for something to really click? Uh, like, again, I don't understand what that means. You know, write copy that doesn't just fill space. What does that mean? Copy that sparks some action. What does that, what does that mean? Getting you results you needed to succeed in this game. You know, give me specifics. Like, show, don't tell, I believe, is the, the cliche that I would use in response to these. And so that's what I want you to be thinking about when you, when you write your copy. Like every single one of you, that you know, all 25 of you and the person who wrote this, I want you to be thinking about that. Like, does like is this sentence hollow 
like, is it just a platitude or is it very specifically about a benefit, an achievement, an aspiration, a thing that people truly want, like that nobody else could have written? That's what makes good copy. And so that's what I want you to think about. So if you're still studying copy and going, what the heck, what do I even look for? We got you covered. This is some, you know, okay. So that was the full lead. This, the lead, there's some good stuff in here. There's some stuff we're salvaging, but really what you want to do is you want to focus on like enticement. Enticement is so crucial in copy, whether you're writing a sales letter, a B2B email, cold outreach, you know, or a freaking product description. You need to learn how to entice, how to engage in that slow unzipping and make it so that the reader actually wants to keep reading it and see what's at the end of that unzipping. So that's that's what good copy can do. Let's Let's actually look at some bullets and then we'll move on to the next thing. All right. How remixing copy generated $2 billion in sales for this ad. This is exactly how you should be approaching your writing process. What do you guys think of that bullet based on the previous contest that we had? We're not doing a one or two thing this time, but uh, you can certainly respond in the chat with a three to just let me know that you're alive and breathing, that you're safe, that you're going to be okay. It lacks usefulness. Yeah. One, listen, I, many copywriters disagree about the use of the word this, this, and this. Um, quick linguistics lesson, this, um, the term for words like this uh, and like how they work is uh, called dixis, D-E-I-X-I-S, I believe. And what that effectively means is that it's a word that is used it doesn't have any intrinsic meaning to it. It is completely contextual. It is completely referential. And like, you know, this to me means something different from any other time in any other place that I would use the word this. So yeah, it this is effectively a hollow word. So this can be interesting sometimes because it can be used to build intrigue, um, but also it can be, how should I say, a way to phone in intrigue, a way to, how should I say, uh, do intrigue, but poorly. I don't have a problem with the, the word this. I do have a problem that this bullet, hey, I used it, is doing it twice back to back. We're not talking about one this here. We're talking about two this is that you need to be fascinated by. And it's referring, I think, to two different things, but I don't know. That's the problem that you run into when you use a word like this. Um, now, here's the thing. Uh, this is a, a small disagreement that I have with Kyle Milligan. He hates the word this because he calls it poor man's intrigue for the reasons that I just described. Uh, but here's the thing. I've been in this game. I know what works and what doesn't. And that's constantly changing. And, you know, there's going to be a point where I'm like old and I'm like, I don't even know what works anymore. Um, but I can tell you this. Ha ha. I did it again. This works. <laughs> In many situations, you know, this does not harm your conversions. This it's not a problem. Um, it does become a problem when it becomes confusing, which I think is what's going on here. And. Ultimately, you know, it's hyperbolic in a sense. It's not clear how it helps the reader. It lacks specifics to create curiosity. Yeah, I think that's it. And, um, you know, remixing copy is a bit confusing to my lizard brain. Yeah, I can I can see that. Um, Maso menos. Um, like, for example, I can imagine this bullet. Like, if, if you want to talk about remixing copy and, like, why it's successful or why it works... You know, what rappers and music 
producers can teach you about generating billions of dollars in ad sales. Minute 346. Like, what? Holy crap. You know, that's very lateral. And so all of a sudden, you know, we're taking the word remixing and we're going like, okay, well, who's the person that remixes? Well, the rappers and music artists. You know, I wouldn't use techno stars. Um, but rappers and music artists, you know, or even music producers, like, you automatically assume, like, okay, rappers, there's, you know, affluence, there's money there. People have that notion. Music producers, like, okay, that feels, like, technical, like, finicky. And then generated $2 billion in ad sales. Like, holy schmidt. You know, that's a very specific, very enticing big number. So... That would be the direction that I would go in with this bullet. And that's how I would create intrigue. Okay, other comments. Uh, instead of saying you can't recopy, it can be like, you know how to recopy, but the difficult, boring part is finding purpose of the exact copy. Uh, no, and I say no softly, gently, lovingly, like, a, like an uncle or a stepdad might, because I, of course, have no control over your life. You know, I don't own you um, because of something that I said earlier in the stream, which is how many people and wisecrackers, you're welcome to answer this too. how many people wake up and go, God, I wish I knew the exact how to find the exact purpose of the exact copy. You know, it's just it like it lacks oomph. It lacks a natural draw. There's no. Until you've built up the aspiration or like the benefits of like doing a thing and intrigue for the thing, then reading and analyzing copy, well, that becomes a mechanism, a, a vehicle that allows people to, you know, roll up on their dreams. But you have to establish the dreams first. You have to speak to people's desires. You have to speak to people's feelings first. And like, I'm not saying that like, oh, you know, start this thing with like Lambos, Bugattis, uh, the harem of 10 women, things like that. No, that's stupid. That only really works on children and idiots. Um, you can do it like this. You don't need to be a master of persuasion to be an in-demand e-commerce copywriter. Like, look at that, an in-demand e-commerce copywriter. It's It puts the B in subtle. You know, that is a thing that people desire. That is a thing that people want. People want to be wanted. That is the subtext of in-demand. E-commerce copywriter that could be something very specific that people want too. You know, it, it, you don't need to promise them that they are, uh, how should I say, going to get a Rolex in 10 minutes. And so that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about cultivating desire and like making sure that that is established first and foremost. I hope that makes sense. So, uh, just leave the second sentence, right? No, I, I wouldn't even leave the second se sentence. I would probably just leave the bullet at like, you know, the secret, you know, uh, the, the copywriting secret that uh, you can learn from, at, you know, rappers and music producers that generated $2 billion in sales. Something along those lines. So what else? Yeah. Poor man's intrigue. Mentioned that. Discover exactly how you can transform your writing with the exact brooch. Exact, exact. Uh, that generated $2 billion. Yeah, it's, it lacks intrigue. And I don't know if I want to transform my writing. You know, that sounds hard. That sounds like it takes work. So let's look at another bullet scrolling down. You know, it definitely go through each of your bullets with this, how should I say, scrutiny. And your writing is going to be better. You're going to get your writing to a much higher level if you write something and then really grill it. Um, level three copy breakdown. If you're able to do these four things, you've officially earned your title as an advanced copywriter. How do you guys feel about that bullet? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I love this bullet. Like, look at this bullet. Bonus tip for sales letters. How to shave 50% off the time it takes to study a sales letter. I, I like that. That's all right. That's useful. It's ultra specific. It's, you know, it's it feels unique. 
you know, I, I can't imagine that being written about anything else. Like it's, it's about studying sales letters. It's about this product. Doesn't feel urgent, but not everything needs urgency. It's like hot sauce, you know, it's like, Hey, get out of my mouth. Hot sauce flavor. Like I want to taste some other, some other things. <laughs> so yeah, this bullet. Yeah. It's a good promise, but it doesn't mean anything to the reader. And it's also not true. Probably. Yeah. That's, that's the thing. Uh, it's like, I, I feel like what you want to do with these is like, you don't need to mention level three copy breakdown. Like the person reading this doesn't care about that. They're not going to be thinking about that. What they are going to be thinking about is like, you know, I want tips. I want tricks. I want things that can help me achieve my goals. I want things that are fascinating. I want things that like actually help me like use this mechanism better. So yeah. And also, like, how many, again, I, I use this joke way too often, but how many of you wake up and be like, I want to be an advanced copywriter? Like, nobody does. Nobody nobody has that in their head. You know, people want to be, like, what, what, what do people want, like, in their heart of hearts? They want to love and to be loved. They want to be valued. They want to be prized. They want to be respected. You know, they want to be revered. They want to be admired. You know, they want to be cared for, and they want to feel care for others. They want to give and to be given to. Nobody wants to be an advanced copywriter. Like, what does that even mean? What does that even get you? So there you go. 3107. Can't tell if people here, let's do this. This is a this is a classic style of bullet. Warning. Brace yourself for the harsh reality of studying copy. You'll never improve if you don't understand this. Yeah, uh, this is the point that I was making. Who wants the title as copywriter? No, people want, you know, cop. Listen, copywriter is the get rich quick scheme du jour, you know, like get rich quick schemes have existed since time immemorial, and it's just a hollow vehicle. It's a mechanism. What allows you to access your dreams right now for the past couple of years? Copywriting is just the thing that's plugging into that empty vessel. So, you know, nobody except for people like me, wake up and want to be a copywriter. People want to use copywriter to get to wherever they can take that vehicle. So that's the thing. Let's see. Four things to top your copywriting journey. Again, like, you know, four things that certainly lack specificity. And what does it mean to top your copywriting journey? You know, <laughs> I mean, you could always go like ridiculous with it and be like, you know, the four steps to truly become a top G copywriter, <laughs> because there what you're what you're selling and what you're advising people to do is become a top G rather than an advanced copywriter. But also, like, if I saw that copy, I'd be like, I'm not publishing that. That's stupid. and That's ridiculous. So. Yeah, it's got some curiosity, but by saying the harsh reality of studying copy, it comes off as hard to do. And that that's that's a thing too. Like I'll give you a difference. Here's a here's a good warning style bullet. Warning, what never to eat on an airplane. Holy shit. Like the moment you read that, you go, I need to know what that is. And I know that that works because that's literally a bullet from a super famous sales letter. It's actually, it was a bullet that was so good. It was made into the headline. So yeah, like that's a good warning bullet. This, it feels like it's actually giving a warning, but not about like, how should I say, uh, something fascinating, something that people would innately want to know. It's, it feels like it's warning people off of copywriting, you know, or at least, yeah, you know, the, this notion of improvement uh, of an understanding, you know, again, understanding is challenging. Understanding is, a it's like learning. Like people, I, what I've discovered, haha, is that the verb to learn, to understand, like those verbs don't work as great. Like they still work sometimes, but they don't work as great in copy because there's an implied amount of work that one needs to do in order to understand, you know, understanding means like literally changing your mind about something. Like 
that's hard. And then learning like, oh my God, that's, that takes effort. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to go to school. You know, I, I dropped out of school so I wouldn't have to go to school and learn stuff. That's stupid. But discovering stuff, uncovering stuff, revealing stuff, you know, that's, that's where you want to end up. So, and like the implications of those is like learning something or uncovering something, seeing something that, you know, other people don't know, or perhaps that was, you know, obscured or hidden from you. You know, those are the things. So I'm not going to go through every single bullet. Setting copy is something you must learn if you actually want success in this game. Again, that's a, you know, hollow benefit. If you're not able to do it properly, landing high paying gigs might not be in the cards for you. So one thing that I see you doing is you're overusing cliches and turns of phrase. Uh, not in the cards for you. Really click. Um, you know, things like that. It, be wary of of that because a lot of a lot of your readers are going to be people of um, how do I say this politely? Average intelligence and a person of average intelligence just they are not going around and paying attention to and accumulating like cliches what they mean and what they imply. So always better to have very specific, meaningful language that doesn't rely on idioms or turns of phrase like that. So yeah, warning, what you should never do when reviewing copy. And I'm going to punch this bullet up. Warning, what never to do when reviewing copy, parentheses, <laughs> this could actually scuttle your copywriting career, end parentheses. There you go. That's that's how I would revise that bullet. Something along those lines. There's always room for punching up from there. So that that's how I feel about this product page. And in person watching, I please please revise this. Please send this back. Uh, hopefully this was helpful. Um, let us know if it wasn't, and please ask questions uh, in email or in Discord uh, about this and uh, what to do uh, if you are confused in any sort of way. For those of you tuning in, uh, we're going over product pages for like copy that's own product pages and reviewing the copy because we will pay you 150 bucks if you write a product page description for us. Uh, the details are in our Discord, but basically you have to have access to the thing, so you have to be a Patreon member. Um, we will review it. You know, we're not going to publish Where's Waldo here. The copy has to actually be good. And what we're doing on these What's Some Wednesdays is reviewing them so that not only you can learn and get better, but also so everybody else can learn and get better. And then uh, third, um, yeah, that's that's basically it. Like, make sure that your payment details are sorted out before you submit because, you know, we're not your accountant. There you go. Okay, let's get into actual submissions from Patreon members. So that was all the product description copy that we're going to cover today. This is a collection. Uh, so just for context, um, on patreon.com slash the copy that show, I'm going to, hey, there's a CTA. I, I, I am do a copy. Um, we recently published a list of practice prompts for basically everybody. And this is one of the practice prompts. Um, create 10 sales email subject lines. And there's like, what, 20, 26, something like that in there. Uh, but yeah, that's available to Patreons, uh, Patreon supporters. Uh, create 10 sub sales email subject lines that entice recipients to open and read the message. The product is a powdered ashwagandha capsule for stress reduction and write a preview for them. So just so you know that whenever you have an email show up in your inbox, there's a subject line and then there's preview text. It used to be called white text because that is mechanically like what people had to actually do to create preview text, but people eventually just added a function to email service providers that allowed, allowed them to have preview text. <laughs> uh... I don't know if I love this bullet. This bullet this is ridiculous, man. You're funny. I'd like feedback on the subject line. The preview is just to implement the exercise. Okay, we'll go over like two or three of these and then I'll share some thoughts about subject lines and how to write good ones. Um, so we've tested this. Previews matter. Preview text absolutely matters. And the best preview text either continues the story of the subject line, makes some promise, or builds intrigue. So 
that is what I would recommend doing for your preview text. Let's look at this. So this is for an ashwagandha supplement. Mix this in your morning coffee to melt stress. Let's let's look at something really quick. So 47 characters. Um, one thing, listen, uh, I once went to a digital marketing conference and there was a marketer there who said that the optimal number of characters, like they did some tests and they took an average of the number of characters. Characters is letters and spaces in a subject line. And they found the average of the subject lines that worked the best, that had the most opens. And they said the optimal length of a subject line is between 12 and 27 characters. Obviously shorter than what you have here. And I just remember Alex and Jonathan and I snickering at our table because of how fucking ridiculous that is. Like, it's so silly. Um, different things always work. And you shouldn't really go by these sort of like arbitrary ranges. The reason why subject lines in that range work or shorter subject lines work in general is because Google, Outlook, your main email service providers only give you a certain number of characters that it will actually show in the subject line before it cuts it off and you know shows the preview text. There's a finite amount. That's why subject lines tend to be short. Okay, so this mix this in your morning coffee to melt stress. I don't like that. I think that's a good subject line. I think it's pretty good. I don't think it's the you know most amazing, unique thing that I've ever seen, but it's solid. That's a that is a subject solid sol, sol, solid subject line. I I can speak. Preview. My husband became another person almost overnight. A much better. I I don't think you need this, but. You can go a couple of ways with this. My husband became another person almost overnight and like start with a quote. Like that's pretty cool. You can also start with like, I felt like I became a different person overnight or I became a different person, you know, like in one day I became a different person. Something along those lines. That would be a benefit. So this, not bad at all. Good job. Ashwagandha 2.0, the miracle protocol. It got out of hand. Big Pharma is worried at how effective Ash is now after... New so this preview, don't love it. You know, intrigue and then enemy, how benefit, like it. you're throwing the kitchen sink at this preview text. No, 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 no. This is okay too. This you would want to send to... Um, a list of buyers or people on an email list that are already familiar with ashwagandha, that already want ashwagandha, that are already familiar with it. So, would specificity hurt this bullet like another how? I'm not sure what you mean, because uh, you said you wanted to delete a better person. Um, well, here's the thing. Preview text, again, it cuts off. You have a finite amount of real estate to say everything that you need to say. Um, so, you know, like pick one, another person or a better person, you know, put your eggs into a, a single basket. Yeah. The second subject line, like it's not, it's not as weak as this, but here's the thing. Um, I recently in, in my inbox domination email masterclass at patreon.com slash the copy batch. Sorry. Sorry. I can't, I can't help myself. Um, I actually went through the database. And I found a list of all the subject lines that had a over 70 to 80% open rate. Like I found, I found them. Like I dug up the data and listed out every subject line in that masterclass of like which ones got opens. And most of the ones that had like that level of opens, they were things like, your product name subscription is here. You know, have you read your product name recently? Like, you know, hey, you know, first name, are you still interested in product name? And so, but like most of those emails were going out to people that like were already buyers, people that had a vested interest 
in that particular product. And so what I'm trying to say with this is that it can work, but it can only really work for people that are already on the you know way more aware side of things. So, yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, hopefully it helped. Uh, write some emails, make some money. There you go. So stressed, avoid these five relaxing supplements. I would change the word um, relaxing to relaxation. And I would change stress to either warning or caution. Why? Because the implication here is that they're not like, I'm not sure what you're trying to get at emotionally here. But if you change that suddenly to warning or caution, you can still achieve the same effect. Like, hey, like maybe like your stress is like high because you're taking these five inferior supplements. What you should be doing is taking ashwagandha or ashwagandha 2.0 or whatever. Um, and so warning, caution, danger, alert, you know, bracket, urgent, end bracket. Like those are all things that tend to get attention it, you know, not if you do it every day, but they do tend to get more attention. And then having this, the negative, avoid these five relaxation supplements. Don't, don't put a period at the end of your subject line. Just don't even worry about that. Um, I think that would be a stronger subject line than what you currently have, just simply because like it's more provocative and it's more specific. Um, you know, a relaxing supplement is different from a relaxation supplement. So that's just a slight nuance in English. So, okay. In that masterclass, the, the, the email marketing masterclass that I have in the Patreon, um, I walk through something that I actually got from Bob Bly's copywriter's handbook, which are the things, the triggers, the emotional triggers that actually cause somebody to buy it, like what they actually want, you know? To, and one, and I added one that I've observed over the course of my career, one or two, and basically just sort of ran through like, you know, to make money, to be liked, et cetera. What are these emotional triggers? And you can actually attach these emotional triggers to different subject lines and use it accordingly. This healthy Xanax cured my stress overnight. Interesting. Legal would might have a problem with this since Xanax is a trademark name. So you might not be able to use that. So be careful with that very careful. Oh, and let's look at the preview text for this. I can't believe doctors still recommend it for stress. This is shocking dangerous. So you would want the adverb there shockingly. Um, and again, like because of the limited real estate you have for preview text, I would just stick with either this or this. And it depends on what your email is going to say. Like, for example, if you are changing this to warning or caution, avoid these five relaxation supplements then this makes more sense. If it's going to be more about like the lack of effectiveness or things like that, you you know, you can still do warning, avoid these five supplements, but um, you could say something along the lines of like, you know, I can't believe Dr. Silver come in for sex, but, but for sex, what am I even saying? Um, this doesn't make sense if we're talking about supplements. You know, why would a doctor recommend a supplement? Most of them don't. So that's something that you want to keep in mind. All right, one more, and then we'll move on to another thing. New stress protocol makes you laugh at your problems. Yeah, I don't love it. You know, it doesn't feel doesn't feel intriguing. Maybe it's a little provocative. But like, here's the thing: if I were an email or an internal marketer, I would say, yeah, it's something worth testing. The study is now considered a medical revolution. Could this be the end of opioids? You bury the lead here, man. This is a stronger subject line than anything that you had before it. Look at that. Subject line. Could this be the end of opioids? Preview text. The studies are in, and they show that you might be able to laugh away your problems. Oh, my God. Now, that's a, that's a hell of a subject line. And so could this be the end of opioids? That's going to get opened, you know. So, 
Yeah. And like, here's the thing. Protocol is one of those words where like people go back and forth on it. Um, but a protocol, like the notions that people tend to have about protocols is that it feels like laid out in front of you. It feels very specific. It feels like, you know, this is the thing that a person needs to do or can do. Um, I'm not sure that it's the best word in this particular case, but you know, like I'm, I don't know. I think, could this be the end of opioids? Nice. Absolutely. That's a strong subject line. And so like, why is that a strong subject line? Because that's provocative. That gets the people going. You know, that asks an open question that can easily relate to very provocative and interesting body copy. There you go. So, um, going through here, we're, I'm just going to look at one of these emails. Um, this is from the same person. Um, and this is a copywriting exercise. Create a disruptive email targeted at middle-aged men with joint pain. Okay. Email one, question, what do you think about the intrigue in this email? Okay, so everybody, I need your, I'm going to need your help with this. Is this email intriguing? Subject line, Big Pharma wants to blacklist the study. Subject line, you know, alternative subject line. These doctors can shield your joint. That is an X. Subject line, I avoided joint surgery. My doctor hates it. Play around with that one. You have something going there. Subject line, America or American media can't show you this joint pain miracle. Play around with that one, too. Um, hold on. By the way, for the person who wrote this doc, I'd add in, in this doc, the previous doc, I'd add oomph to the five relaxation supplements um, to tease the fact that the audience probably uses these supplements every day in large quantities. Um, maybe not in the subject line, perhaps in the preview text, but definitely in the body copy. Like if you were to write that email, I think that, you know, you can build a lot of intrigue by mentioning that these five supplements are potentially things that you would be taking every single day. So yeah, Kevin thinks that the third one. Biden wants to blacklist this study. <laughs> That's provocative. Legal is going to say, like, what, what are you saying? Like, what's the backup for that? So one has intrigue, four has some potential. Yeah, I would agree with that. Big Pharma wants to blacklist this study. Yeah, one, one of the, um, and this is especially true at Agora, uh, there has been a large crackdown on pandering. And simply saying big pharma to pander to people who don't like big pharma has been, how should I say, subtly quashed. But I'm not sure if they're still doing that because right now one of the best-selling sales letter at Agora is um, uh, Biden wants to replace the dollar with a trackable spyware version of it. So, you know, it's obviously pandering. So I, I just don't even know. <laughs> Biden hates your painful joy. <laughs> I'm not sure that that would work. <coughs> Biden is envious of your joints. It's because he's so old. He just wants to smell them as though they were the hair of a little girl. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, Biden Biden would catch uh, some attention for sure. Um, but you have to like you have to tie it to something. you know you can't just do that hollowly, especially like if you're writing for a company that cares about compliance. Like you can run into some trouble if you don't have some kind of backup for that. Uh, anywho, dear reader, this study was strangely not shown in American news. Um, this is wordy. It's sort of in passive voice, you know, shown, you know, past participle was to be, you know. Yeah, the study was strangely not. It's just awkwardly worded. You know, it, it you're trying to come out, I can tell, with an emotional punch. But let me try to rephrase it to have more emotional punch. Dear reader, 
the American news was not brave enough to show you this study. The American news, you know, what, what would it be? The American news has tried to keep this study under wraps. The American news, <laughs> you know, look at what I'm doing with the subject there. Rather than like this study, I'm starting with the American news and ending with the study. Um, in terms of sentences and the power positions and sentences, the first and the last position of a sentence um, tends to be the most powerful. That's what, you know, people that are skimming, that's what people are going to take away the most. Um, I think that if you start with like the mainstream media or something along those lines and then pivot to like the study as being the point of intrigue, I think that would be stronger. As it stands right now, it's a little awkwardly worded. One thing, listen, I hate to go full English teacher on you, but adverbs can be a little dangerous. Strangely, naturally. Like, adverbs, what do they do? They modify adjectives. They modify, like, whole sentences. They modify clauses. They modify verbs. So, strangely, it's modifying, not shown. So, is that as strong as the American news, you know, did not reveal this strange study to you? Like, is that more powerful? I would say, yeah. You know, and, but what do we do? We change that from an adverb to an adjective describing the study. It actually added power, in my opinion. Adverbs, you know, I'm not a huge fan of Strunk and White, the Ellens of style and things like that. Um, I think that adverbs are fine, but they add wordiness sometimes when you don't want to be wordy. And here you want to be punchy and not wordy. Now that, that is a subject line. <laughs> uh, yeah. So how does American news and media land with legal? Uh, it's totally fine. So here's the thing. Again, like you have to be cautious of the claims. Like, you know, if you say like the mainstream media has been, you know, silent about a strange new study out of the University of Toronto, you know, that's specific, that's intriguing, it paints an enemy. And also, here's the thing. If legal comes back and says, like, what do you mean they were silent? You can say, well, I looked at a bunch of news sites and there was no information about the study. And then legal will be like, OK, that's how you back up. I'm serious. That's that's how you back up claims as a copywriter. That's how it works. So. It claims you can shield your joints naturally. So it claims you can. How is that for specificity? How is that for believability? I don't know. You know, would you rather listen to a study that claims you can shield your joints? Or would you rather listen to a study that proves you can shield your joints? that showed that 83% of test subjects suddenly had shielded joints or joints shielded from, you know, pain or arthritis or whatever affliction you're writing about. Lifts are tricky because if you're too vague, you're going to be dismissed as spam. You're not going to be building intrigue. Rather, you are going to be just effectively saying something that people can just dismiss. But at the same time, you don't want to be too specific because the job of a lift is not to sell somebody. The job of a lift is to get the click. So you have to be cautious about that tightrope. Um, yeah. You open a loop and then kill the intrigue in the next line. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's tough. You know, lists are tough. And I, what I would say is that what you want to do is you want to pull something specific out of the study because it's going to be believable and two, because it's going to actually assert it like a clearer benefit. So proof works better.
Absolutely. And going back to what I said before in the stream, don't say it if it's not true. Unless it's really funny and it's about Biden. <laughs> the only exception. <laughs> Trump too. Trump too. I'm, I'm an equal opportunity hater. And it's not another herb cheap trick. I'm not sure what that sentence is doing. Big Pharma may blacklist this study. Hmm. You have to be careful with stuff like that because, you know, I wish I had teed up some examples of like health emails that do this really well. Um, because like what power does Big Pharma have to blacklist a study? And like, what does that even mean? And so like on the one hand, you would say, yeah, yeah, it's provocative. It gets the people going. But at the same time, what I would say is like it's more interesting and more compelling and certainly more believable if you have some sort of just like true justification for what big pharma can do to the study or this idea. And yeah, and the way that other lists have done this in the past is something along the lines of like, you know, big pharma, you know, might act to suppress this information. And what you can do is, you know, legal is going to come at you and be like, what do you mean by that? And you say like, I use the word might for one legal, Mr. Legal person. And then the second thing that you can say is, well, you know, Big Pharma does have a history of suppressing studies simply by conducting these studies and then either not using that information to inform the drugs that they make or conversely to like, you know, you just leave it there. That's all you need to say. And so that's a different set of notions, connotations, denotations than may blacklist. Those are the things that you want to be sensitive to when you read and study a lot of these styles of lifts. Um, because again, it is so, so easy to be dismissed as a bullshitter or spam or things like that. So the real key to making these things works work is believability and like really finely honed language that evokes not only the emotion that you're going for, but also a sense of reality. Okay. It's signaling the end of joint surgeries for good. Now here's, yeah, it's signaling the end doesn't, it, like what I like about that sentence is you're not actually coming out and saying like, this is the end of joint surgeries for good. You know, what does it signaling mean? It can mean, it can mean anything. It, it can, it's provocative. It gets the people going. Um, I have a feeling legal might come at that, but at the same time, like that's, that's fine. Where you might run into trouble with either a client or with a prospect is um, like the end of joint surgeries for good. Um, and so one way to work around that, both in terms of the believability and the compliance side is, you know, for some study participants, it meant the end of joint surgery or like, you know, for some participants in the study, it's signaled or like, you know, you might want to use a different verb in that case, but like you would refer specifically back to the study or to the group of people or like the benefit that they got from it. And that's how you would want to sort of finesse that. Watch it before they take it down. Um, not the best CTA in the world. Um, blink, blink, sincerely blink, blink. Can that be a good subject line? Um, it's signaling the end of joint surgeries for good. What you would want to do is you would want to frame that as a question. Like, does this mean the end of joint surgeries? You know, something along those lines, you know, because it's a question. You're not saying a thing. It's just provocative. It gets the people going. Um, and then what you can do is you can, once people read the email, you can fine tune that with like, you know, in this study, you know, it, it signaled the end of joint surgeries or, you know, it saved people from joint surgeries or what have you. You would obviously only want to say it if it's true um, or if there's something that you can use to back it up. So that's how I would do that as a subject line. Watch it before they take it down. It's kind of a weak CTA. Um, Sean's in Paris. Yeah, uh, he he's getting the references. Um, you're doing a good thing here. It's not another herb cheek tree. I still don't know what you're saying with this sentence. 
I think you're trying to like say like, hey, this is not a thing that you recognized before. Um, and then you're linking to the sub, you know, the sales page, which again, that's good. You're creating what's called a link sandwich. Solid work. You're doing good. Don't really know what the sentence is saying. So weak copy here. I think this is a weak CTA here because it lacks specificity. And, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. Click here to watch it before they take it down is better than watch it before they take it down. Um, but even that can be punched up simply, you know, watch this, you know, quick three minute video before, you know, big pharma files a cease and desist order or something like that. Again, don't make shit up like that, but I'm saying that like that would add some sense of urgency and like justifiable urgency and also be more specific. So. Doing not statements, creating curiosity, I think. Uh, it depends. <laughs> Legal is not going to sign off on this. That's just ridiculous. You can do this if it's funny. Like, if it's clearly a joke. Legal is like, okay, that's fine. You know, you know that's totally, totally fine, as long as it's signaled. But, you know, otherwise, you can't say stuff. So I'm just going to look at that one email. We have other things that we need to actually look at. Um, so Conrado, do you have any questions about anything that I've been saying? Hopefully some of this has been helpful. Yeah, no, you're doing good, but keep in mind, what do I keep saying about specificity? It can't be written about any other situation at any other time about any other product. Watch it before they take it down is not specific. You know, you can plug and play that anywhere. So what you would want to do is make it very specific to this moment. So. Yeah, the CTA might work, but again, specificity sells. And asking directly for the click is, it just statistically, historically has worked better than assuming that people understand what you're trying to get. From what I understand, emails that directed to the sales page have the main goal to get the click, right? Yep. And then the sales page is going to do the work. Yes, that's absolutely correct. So, you know, it's like, again, the purpose of a lift is to literally lift people from their inbox to the sales letter. The sales letter does the selling and the lift gets the click. You know, all you need to do is provide enough information that if somebody is intrigued enough to read the sales copy. That's the purpose of a lift. And my gripe with this was not that it's not functioning as a CTA. My gripe with it is that it's just not very specific and it could be stronger. So let us move on. Moving on up. Okay. I'm closing some stuff so my computer doesn't fry. It's, it's getting hot in here. But we're almost done. Okay. Really quick. Oh. Something good. I once heard about lifts. We have we have a quick lesson coming from coming from the chat. I, I would like to share this before we move on. Get them emotional and get them to click. That's, that is a good piece of advice. Okay, really quick, just I'm getting organized because I want to make sure that I review everybody's copy that I promised to. Hold on, I, I think I might have missed somebody. I, like I promised somebody that I would read their copy and then I didn't. So Aha. Okay. Yes, we have one more product page to go over. So and then that is going to be um, this, this, this. Um, 
for everybody that submitted copy, this looks interesting. I want I want to I want to read this. Uh, that that gets bumped up. Um, pick one piece of copy that you want me to to review next, and then I'll I'll uh, go through it. But this is a uh, another product page. Okay, um, this is. Let me show you what this is for. Market research. Um, hold on. Do I have good market research behind it? I don't even know which product this is for. Oh, this is for this. Okay. I would like to review all the pieces of copy submitted today. Um, I am going to cut it off at where I started streaming um, because I don't want to be here all night. And also, I had intended to do this for only 90 minutes, but it's on two hours. And like, I still have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces of copy to review. So some people are going to be disappointed tonight, you know, like ex lovers of mine. Sorry. OK, um, first things first, go back to the beginning of the stream and look at all the advice that I gave about having teaser copy. You need to start with some bullets, that little pocket of bullets you know, in the upper right for product descriptions, depending upon the format of the page, which we want it. Now, second thing, let's go right into the headline for this. Your copy is not worth a dime if you don't have good market research behind it. Let's assess this headline really quick. Is it useful? All right. Not really, not really feeling the, the usefulness so much. As in, like, yes, you need market research, but what does isn't worth a dime mean? You know, what's the intrinsic benefit of that? Your copy will be will be worth a dime if you do have market research. Things get sticky really quickly. Ultra specific. Could this be written about any other market research product? Like, say you plug this at the top of Daniel Throssell's Market Detective. Could this still work? Yeah. So it lacks specificity. What about uniqueness? Mm. You know, if somebody sees market research, they're going to be like, eh, you know, I'm good. It feels like work. Copy isn't worth a dime. You know, that's a cliche. Go back to what I said earlier about cliches in the stream. So, you know, already you went for the very direct route, which is fine, as long as directness is also packaged in enticing. And I don't know if this feels enticing. So, yeah, I read it and I'm like, OK, yeah, it doesn't again, it doesn't grab by the short and curlies. So no matter how good someone is at something, even if they are the best, they're only useful with the tools that allow them to do their job. That's not a good first sentence. Your first sentence needs to be a punch in the face. It needs to be it, in um, journalism and in copy. The first sentence is sometimes called the stinger. And some people write using stingers and some people don't. But this sentence, it's busy. You know, there's a lot of clauses, nested clauses. It's not very punchy and it's not very specific, no matter how good someone is at something. Again, you, you can literally plug and play that anywhere. As a copywriter, your tool is your research. So they're only useful with the tools that allow them to do their job as a copy or tool is your research. I see kind of what you're doing here, but this is falling into sort of the same problem that the other product description was running into, which is that you're coming 
right out of the gate and immediately being like, you got to have product research or you got to have market research or something along those lines. And again, do, do you person wake up naked, sweating, screaming every single morning going, God damn, I wish I had market research. No, you know, the, the, the market research is your vehicle to something, but what you need to sort of paint for people initially is what that something is. And I showed examples earlier in the stream of like what that something could be without like over promising or saying $10,000 or saying Bugattis or something like that. It can be very, it can put, it can put the B in subtle. I'm not saying be hyperbolic. What I'm saying is you need to paint the picture of what the person wants first and then hitch the mechanism to that horse, if that makes sense. I'm using horse and carriage metaphors now. That's what happens after two hours. Yeah. The copy is talking at me. It's not talking with me. It's not speaking to my emotions. You need to know more about your topic than anyone else to write the type of copy that helps you. You're doing um, something here that I've talked about in many previous streams before. Your sentences, this one and this one, why do they feel wordy? And people that have been watching for a long time, people like fans of copy that, what do I always say on these streams? What are these sentences doing that is causing them to be wordy and causing them to be hard to like read and understand? Uh, like I'll, I'll, I will give a digital cookie to, to anybody that has the answer. I could just, I can just chill. I'm just going to chill. All 20 of you. How are you doing? How's it going? It's good to see you. Thank you for joining today. I appreciate you. All right. If nobody has the answer, the thing that I always say about these kinds of sentences is that they are guilty of preposition stacking. You need to know. It's technically an infinitive, but it's, we're going to say about your topic and then anyone else to write the types of copy that helps you reach the financial success every newbie copywriter dreams of. The thing with prepositional phrases and the thing with stacking, you know, many different nested clauses in a single sentence is that they're hard to read. They, they become breathless. Uh, they become hard to parse and understand. Um, yeah, it's just and like that's the whole point of like using like, you know, adverbial phrases, using commas to like separate things out into like introductory phrases. Yeah, th th this sentence just it just keeps going on and on. It's not a run on, you know, that, that means something different. Um, what this sentence is doing is just stacking up so many phrases in a row that it's, I lose the meaning. But research can be complex. I don't know where to start. How do I find my market's deepest pains and desires? Do I have enough? You know, you need to research, but don't know where to start. Um, yeah, like I'm, I'm of doubly minds about this. Like you can either start by articulating the problem um, really, really well and in really enticing fashion, or you can just sort of build up the aspiration first, like what people desire. And then like mentioned that market research is like the thing that can help people achieve that desire. Um, you know, in that case, like, you know, it would be like the aspiration could be either a thing that people want or a problem that people have and then like an agitation. And then, you know, you would say like in market research is the solution. Um, there you go. Hooray. And yeah, so this isn't really working for me. It's not. And the reason why is, you know, go back to some of the other product descriptions that are reviewed earlier in the stream because uh, I, I think I spoke pretty succinctly about like, you know, painting something as being like difficult versus like 
in opposition to that, agitating a problem that people have and like making them like feel a need or feel a desire. You know, I think here, you know, you're trying to voice the questions that people have, um, but I think you should do it with more finesse. Um, and earlier I showed examples of like do, what doing that with finesse looks like. That's the problem that Alex encounters every time he takes on a new project and you can watch him do the research for his very own e-commerce business from start to finish. Um, the other thing that's going on with this particular lead is that it just doesn't feel very emotional. You know, you're not, you're not writing emotionally. You're writing very factually, very directly. Um, you're not giving the copy space, like that gradual time to breathe or to evoke emotion or feelings or sensations. Um, and that's something that I think you should work on. The thing to improve that immediately, and anybody watching now or in the future can improve their copy immediately by paying attention to the verbs that people use. Um, like, for example, instead of, you know, get rid of, you can say crush or smash. I'm pretty sure uh, my baby is crying in the background. So, yeah, uh, that's that's the advice that I have for that particular lead. This is not a course about how to do market research. This is a professional copywriter doing real market research and allowing you to watch while he gives you tips, tricks, and advice. Again, too me that sentence is too mealy, too much for me to swallow. You'll see the process required to create the copy businesses are clamoring for and will pay big money to attain. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Everybody watching, how how do you feel about this this transition to the bullets? Like again, if there's an innate baked in demand to see a person do research, maybe I'm wrong, but only you guys, all all twenty of you watching, you tell me. Like, hit Y in chat if you're just like. Yes, this speaks to me and the things that I want. Or two, if you're just like, eh. I think I think I might have lost some viewers along the way. Perhaps. Or maybe chat is just not loading. I have no way of knowing. Uh, maybe I'm just talking into the void. I've done that before many times, sometimes even today. Yeah, th this is this is just not working for me. And I think part of that, you know, it might be a referred pain problem where you're just not evoking enough emotion, stoking enough desire earlier on about like what this is for or like what this is good for. You know, the problem that people have is not, I don't know how to do research. It's a question people have once they realize that research is the vehicle to their desire. Now you as a copywriter need to investigate what that desire actually is and speak to that. So hopefully that makes sense. Now let's look at some of these bullets. Why market research is so valuable and how it can transform your copy from bad to great, even if you are a beginner. Why bullets are challenging? Because people, you know, a lot of people don't really wonder why about things. You know, the the average person is deeply incurious. Uh, sorry, you know, long time marketer, uh, the cynicism is coming out. People are just deeply incurious people. Um, you know, at least average people are. So, you know, if you've done your job as a copywriter by this point, people already understand why market research is valuable. And so this bullet is rendered moot. So valuable plugins and extensions that cut through the fluff and drastically reduce the amount of time you need to research. <sighs> Stronger, in my opinion, would be to do the bullets more like this, and I will show you here. 
¿Qué harías? Look at this. 729. The unfair advantage new copywriters have over more experienced copywriters. Knowing how to leverage this can give you a massive leg up over more experienced writers. That feels useful. That feels enticing. That's fascinating. It's not giving away the farm. It feels beneficial. And like, it feels like something that I want to know. And also, I know exactly where this is going to be revealed. And you can do that too. What you do is like, you know, video three, you know, and I wouldn't talk about valuable plugins and extensions, you know, like you can mention that, but that would be like an ancillary thing. You know, people are going to be scrolling through that and be like, valuable plugins and extensions. Okay, like who cares? And so start with something enticing, something clearly beneficial, something clearly useful. How to swipe from your competition and use their copy to get a leg up on them. If you are a non-copywriter, or if you haven't been in this world for very long, do people automatically understand what swiping means? You know, th these are the questions you kind of have to ask with every single line of copy, every single bullet that you write. That's going to make your copy stronger. The thing is, like, a lot of these bullets are very direct. They're like, you know, I'm going to invent a term here that I hopefully I'll use again. Um, these are what I would call, like, surface level bullets. Bullets where... You know, it's clear that you have not probed down into the dirt of like, you know, what makes something really fascinating, what people deeply desire, how this bullet connects to something that people deeply desire. You know, compare that with this. You know, this particular writer, you know, he had a bunch of bullets that felt like surface level bullets. And I, what I said was like, go and write 100 and then throw them away and then write 100 more. And he did that. He he wrote a ton of bullets. And then he, what he did is he filtered down to only the ones that felt the strongest. And I got to be honest, like when he finally like actually submitted this copy after getting reviewed in previous What's On Wednesdays, like these bullets, I didn't have to do hardly any editing, like mostly just like tightening, you know, you know, some fluff and stuff like that. But these bullets were solid. And it's because, you know, he took the time to really investigate really like dig deep, get all the, the surface level bullets out of the way and just like find and pry open that deeper desire, that deeper thing, that deeper fascination that could get somebody to be interested. What is a tribe? And how understanding it allows you to speak directly to your market and their wallets. Yeah, it's these are not salvageable because they're still surface level bullets, you know, and by surface level bullets, I mean, like they're more feature driven rather than benefit driven. And they're certainly not really motivated by like a fascination that really grips people. Again, I go back to the joke that I've repeated now, like four times on the stream. Do people like, you know, in the middle of working out, they're doing a bicep curl and like the intrusive thought pops into their head. Like, oh my God, what is a tribe? That's the sort of thing that you want in your bullets and your headlines. You want that intrusive thought. You want that like, you know, waking up in the morning and you're just dreading starting the day because your life lacks blank. That is where the power of copy is. If you can find out what that blank is, my life would be, you know, you whip off the sheets and the person's just sitting there in bed and they're looking at their slippers and they're going like, what is my life? I wish I had this blank. Like that is the type of desire that you're trying to tap into when you write copy. Now, the way that you can do that is by talking about like what understanding a tribe can get you. Like, you know, these are the material benefits that understanding tribes gets like, you know, Hey, it increases conversions. Hey, it increases retention. Like, you know, those that's better. That's, you know, one or two levels down beyond the surface level bullet. 
but then there's another, you know, a few levels down. And maybe one day I'll actually like write a report or create a video where I like actually systematize or um, flesh out my thinking on this matter about like the different levels of bullet. And the deepest level of bullet would be something like undismissible, something truly fascinating, something very lateral and unexpected. The best example that I have for that is how a pickpocket can cure your back pain. Turn to page 27. I frequently cite that as the best bullet ever written. It's so specific. It's so useful. It's so fascinating and intriguing. And in a way, it's kind of urgent. It tells you to flip to page 27. You know, it, it sort of lacks on the urgency, but also tells you exactly what you can do next. It gives people the next action, which of course would be inf more information about how to buy something. Um, and so that's the sort of lateral thinking that you want to bring to this. And by the way, that's the sort of thinking that like chat GPT can't really do for anybody. Like I've tried, I've tried to get more lateral weird stuff out of chat GPT. And it's just not, it's not happening. You know, like the type of thinking and the type of knowledge that you need to bring to bear to get out a bullet, like how a pickpocket can cure your back pain. You know, that's just not what large language models can do, but it is what a good copywriter can do. And so that is what I would invite you to think about when it comes to surface level bullets like this. So that's, this is what I want you to, to do when you revise this. And when you, you know, go back to blank page and just start over and start rethinking about like how you would approach this, really think about like either the aspiration, the thing that people want and like approaching that in a way, or conversely, a real problem that people have, like a real agitation of it and how market research provides a problem. If you want to swipe, if you want something to study that does this really well, look at this. You know, we got copy on our page already that does this. The other one for inbox domination, the email masterclass, that has good copy for it too, that you can also swipe. Two completely different approaches, mind you, but both successfully accomplish um, the goal that you are setting out to do. So hopefully that helped. Um, hopefully that gave you some context. Text me you know, on Discord or in chat if you have any more questions. I'm going to jump into and really quickly just sort of rapid fire some advice for each of these. Okay. Product description copy. Laced. Context. Was tasked to write two short product descriptions as part of a job application to a junior copywriter position. Oh my God. I hope you knocked this out of the park. Nike Dunk Low Next Nature Cream Women's. I'm assuming that's a product, like a specific product that I can find. Hold on. We, we, we need to we need to investigate. And I'm just going to copy this text because I don't think like these words are so arbitrary enough that I don't think I could use any sort of mnemonic to remember what they are in this sequence. Women's dunk low next nature. Buy women's dunk low next nature. Women's dunk low next nature. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, you know. <laughs> oh, there you go. Ethical sourcing meets effortless style. A suitable spin on a timeless classic. These low cut sneakers are made with 20% recycled materials and come in an elegant cream colorway, allowing you to help the planet whilst, don't use the word whilst, looking hella good in the. Don't use the word whilst and then use the words hella good. What are you thinking? <laughs> and the Nike Dunk Low Next Nature Cream Women's to your collection now. Looking at this copy, it seems like everything is, it's Nike Women's and then WMNS Dunk Low Next Nature. So you might want to get some clarity on like the order of these words, like what they actually are and figure that out. Because these are women's, 
Nike Dunk Low Next Natures. So there you go. The thing that I would caution you about when it comes to this is that you are putting a lot of emphasis on ethical sourcing, sustainable, 20% recycled materials. So that's all very specific. But is that a thing that people want? I'm sure, like, you have to understand, like, sustainability and, like, you know, what Starbucks does with, um, you know, every coffee pays for, like, you know, all natural, you know, like, coffee from real Colombian farmers, you know, ethically sourced and stuff like that. What is the psychological purpose of that and mentioning that? Like, uh, like if it were truly ethical in a, you know, Kantian deontological sense, you wouldn't mention it at all. You would just do it because it was good. That's not why marketing mentions it. Marketing copy mentions things like ethical sourcing, sustainability, you know, recycled materials, things like that, because it alleviates the pain and the guilt that comes hand in hand with consumerism. I'm 100% serious. What that kind of copy does is give people a pass when it comes to making a buying decision that if we looked at it objectively, is it's just inexcusable. Buying anything is inexcusable. It's, you know, out of context, Sean, right there. Um, but no, the reason why you mentioned that is to sort of like smooth over the ethical objections that people have. And that's important, especially for a company like Nike, you know, sweatshops. I shouldn't say that one of the members of copy that does work with Nike. Um, and so ultimately, yeah, like people are going to have that sort of baked in their heads, but it's not the primary thing that's going to be on their minds. And what do people have on their mind when it comes to a shoe? They want to look good. They want it to be comfortable. They want it to be functional. But where is that? You know, you have a feature. The only real, like, true benefit that I see here to people is looking hella good. And as far as benefits go, that is just not very specific. You know, again, specificity being a thing that you could say only about this and nothing else. So what are the specific benefits, the specific things about this shoe that you can say about that shoe that you can say about no other shoe? That is going to get you better product description copy. Um, Maso Menos, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is this notion that every human has a sort of like base level of needs and that once those needs are met, they go on seeking other things uh, to fulfill their desires. Um, and then Viktor Frankl came in with Man's Search for Meaning and said that, well, even beyond that hierarchy of needs, there's this other thing, the self-transcendence, like, you know, living for others, giving, you know, higher values, et cetera. Um, so what I was saying was it didn't really have to do with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What it, what it had to do was with the fact that like every single person who buys something, especially uh, I'm just not going to, uh, how should I say, paint this over liberals, uh, leftists, you know, people that uh, let's be real. We live in the United States. You can't escape consumerism. But there's only one group of people that feels really guilty about it, and it's leftists and liberals, which, like, understandable. Consumerism is not good. And so, you know, leftists won, Republicans zero. I I don't know. I don't do politics. I do do politics, but I'm just joking. Um, and so the one thing that you kind of got to keep in mind is when you're speaking to them is that, that they do have certain values. And one of the objections that they are going to have that other people might not is concern about the ethics and the viability and the sustainability of what they're doing. Um, you know, you don't need to do that for every single product. 
and it certainly doesn't not need to be the main focus of what you're doing. So here, I think too much focus is placed on that. Not enough focus is placed on like, why do I want this shoe? You know? Yeezy Slide Onyx. Um, activism has become the new product placement, in my opinion. And I don't know if I would agree. And the reason for that is because, uh, let me put it this way. Businesses have always known how to co-opt radical movements for their own benefit and profit. It's always been the case. You know, like, for example, um, the leader of the Proud Boys has a number of, I guess, t-shirt companies that sell t-shirts both to Trump supporters and to Antifa. He doesn't care. He just wants money. And so, like, you know, activism, like, again, it's just an, it's a hollow vehicle that has been plugged in with something else. So, uh, ultimately, uh, it was Slavo Zizek, I think, who was talking about that notion of, like, when you advertise how ethical or environmental something is, what you're doing is you're allowing somebody to buy what is effectively like Catholic absolution, like like a confession, like, oh, OK, the priest has like forgiven you of your sins, the sin of consumerism. And by advertising things like, you know, ESG, uh, environmentalism, sustainability, ethical sourcing, things like that, you're basically saying like, OK, I can buy absolution. That is the psychological thing that's happening there. So it's very it's very Catholic. <laughs> Buying the guilt away. I can think of nothing more American. Easy slide onyx. You can never go wrong with black slides, especially when they're this comfortable. Okay, we're starting with a benefit. Great. It's easy to see why the Yeezy slide onyx is seen. Okay. With product descriptions, you have a very, very small amount of real estate. Easy to see why this is seen. That's not working for me, Chief. Rewrite that. As an absolute must cop by sneakerheads worldwide is an absolute must cop. I'm guessing cop is slang for getting something. I'm old. Help me, please, chat. What what is the what does must cop mean it from like translate that from zillennial to boomer, please? Grab. An absolute must grab by sneakerheads worldwide. Now since I'm guessing you are a zillennial and I'm a boomer, let me ask you this. When I read, this is an absolute must cop, I go, that's cringe as fuck. How do you feel about it? <laughs> I'm, I'm deeply curious. It comes off as a bit tryhard, for real, for real. On God, no cap. <laughs> uh, I'm going to zillennial hell, uh, in that I am going to hell and will be surrounded by people from Gen Z. Endless comfort, minimalistic design, and an all-black everything colorway ensures simp... Okay, one, this is very dense. It's very dense. Dense is good for product descriptions, but you are effectively duplicating the benefit here with this benefit. So again, limited real estate, do you want to be emphasizing the same point twice or do you want to like either give different contours to that benefit or different benefits? There you go. Minimalistic design, cool, and an all black everything colorway ensures simple styling to match any outfit or occasion. Sentence is a little hard to understand, I'm not going to lie, but I think I understand what you're trying to say. Shop the Yeezy Slide Onyx with Laced. So I would rewrite that 
I, I would just sort of like break this apart into two sentences or like frame it a little bit differently. L listen, if I were hiring you to write product descriptions, I would say that you are solidly in the B minus to B territory. The big issue that you are running into right now that I can see is that you are focusing on features. You are sort of ignoring benefits. And by doing that, you're also, how should I say, you're trying to be clever. Like this, this is clearly you trying to be clever. But by trying to be clever, you're sacrificing clarity. And that makes your copy worse. So keep that in mind. And that's all I have to say about these two product descriptions. So hostage tape. This, now this looks interesting. Hostage tape logo by more like, okay, listen, I want everybody who's watching right now to look at this and go, sweet. Like this is what copy should look like when I submit a page to a client. Because this is exactly what copy should look like when you submit it to a client, especially if you're writing a specific sales page or some sort of page that you want to be mocked up or designed. Like by doing this in this style, you are effectively showing the business that you want to write for. Like, hey, like this is how I want this to be designed, how I want this to look. And then like a good designer will just be able to like take it to the next level. So good stuff. Get rid of your chainsaw snoring with hostage tape, the strongest mouth tape on the planet. Okay. Now here's the cool thing about this. The people that land on this page, it is a landing page after all, are already going to have some modicum of understanding of what hostage tape is for based on the ads they saw that brought them here. You know, I'm guessing it's going to be a Facebook ad with some sort of video that talks about like, you know, snoring. So you handle the sort of like more problem aware, less solution aware people um, in that initial ad, that initial touch point. If you were reaching out to unaware or problem aware people, like for example, you know, people that don't know what snoring is or what have you, um, you would want to start this page differently. And you would want to use a, more of a subtle structure that either advertorial or lift that entices people to read the sales page. And the sales page is more about building fascination for a mechanism. And then, you know, the mechanism proves out the idea that you had before. Okay, that's typical. This is going to be different. This is the type of thing where you are going to see network ads, uh, articles, you're going to see Facebook ads, video ads, things that are going to show like people taping their mouth shut to build entry because that's just a weird thing to do. And then all of a sudden, the video ad is going to describe something along the lines of like, you know, why you would want to do this. And so that initial persuasion is already going to have begun before people get to this page. That's the point of most sales landing pages. And so it's okay to be a little bit more direct here. This is the clear benefit. Get rid of your chainsaw snoring. Um, for those of you, oh God, what, what was the name of the book? Breath? I forget the name of it. Um, yeah, th this is this has been popping off, as the Zillennials say. Um, James Nestor Breath. And it really just sort of looked at the difference, like what is happening to people, especially when it comes to uh, their respiratory system and how they breathe and, and what they do. Um, and... There are, if you actually go into this book, you're going to be able to pull so many different benefits. Um, I think at one in one chapter, it actually discusses like how breathing through your nose at night can actually change the structure, like strengthen your jawline to strengthen the 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 actual maxillofacial features of your face. Uh, that was that was alliterative. Hmm. Um, so when you're writing about something like this, always look to books, look to research, look to to pop research and, you know, social psychology books, because you're going to be able to pull a lot of stuff from that. And that book is going to be able to serve proof for whatever you're writing. Cool thing about books too, is when you're pulling from a book and if legal is ever just like, Hey, you know, this claim, where'd you get it? You can just show them the page in the book and they'll be like, okay, the book serves as the proof. So 
There you go. Demo of guy putting it on. Um, yeah, totally solid. And stop mouth breathing tonight. I don't even know if you need this and, but this feels this feels fine for me given the context. Get life changing sleep now. I like that. Okay. What the hell does putting tape in on your mouth do? You're skeptical, huh? Simple. Tape your mouth shut and you'll be forced to breathe through your nose. Oh, hold on. Okay. So I need I need to zoom out a little bit so that I can get the full the full picture. How do I not see uh, uh here we go. What the hell does putting tape in on your mouth do? I I don't know if um you need this right here. Um Yeah, I don't know if you need that because you're already voicing the skepticism. So that's already there. Simple. Tape your mouth shut and you'll be forced to breathe through your nose. When you promote nasal breathing, you're basically... This is one of those things where it's like, you know, there's three levels of edits. There's value edits, there's function edits, and then there's line edits. Value edits are like, is your idea good? Is your the approach, the angle, the thing that you want to do, is it good? Is it worth doing it that way? You know, very high level. You don't even need to read the copy to like assess that and re rewrite it if it's wrong. Functional edits are like, you know, does this section belong here? Are these paragraphs in the right order? Does it have a good flow? Yada, yada, yada. You know, is it functioning to the degree that you want it to function? Line edits are like word by word, paragraph by paragraph. Like, is this stated as clearly and um, punchily as possible? The previous piece of copy that I was looking at, uh, I was doing line edits, basically. Um, and looking for places to add value. Um, but mostly I was doing line edits. This needs line edits. You need to look and see like, you know, do I need this? If I remove this, is it going to ultimately damage the copy? No? Okay, cut it. Tape your mouth shut and you'll be forced to breathe through your nose. When you promote nasal breathing, you're basically eliminating. Wouldn't that sound better if you said, when you promote nasal breathing, you eliminate? You know, that, that that's, you know, ultimately, I think it sounds better with fewer words, less wordiness, less mealiness. Um, but that's ultimately, that ultimately comes down to you and, of course, the client. But you need to look at this sentence by sentence and go, like, can I write this better? Can I eliminate words? Can I say this more clearly? Is there a way to be more succinct? You know, with copy, people are going to be skimming. And so every single line, every single sentence needs to get that message, like, basically to the point where it's immediate. You're eliminating, you eliminate snoring, dry mouth, bad breath, reduced oxygen intake. Getting more oxygen will help you wake up feeling. Why not write, get more oxygen, and you will wake up feeling more refreshed. You know, it's just, it, it's like small tweaks like that. That's, that's where we are with this copy. You know, 18% additional oxygen absorbed. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's the, the case here, but certainly worth thinking about, you know. Yeah, it's get more oxygen. Yeah. I, instead of get more oxygen, I would I would um, you know focus on one of these other benefits. I'm, I'm not sure if like so the way this works is you click on one of these buttons and it takes you down or takes me to an order form page or something along those lines. I'm not sure if get more oxygen is what you want to be targeting there. Okay, great testimonials, amazing people with the 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 picture things like that. This person, poor Magnolia, man, like, I can tell you why she's probably not getting enough oxygen through her nose. <laughs> uh, 
like I, i'm what, what is she doing you know breathing through a snorkel in her ears like what's going on here man like no wonder she has obstructive sleep apnea <laughs> uh uh it is to laugh uh no but yeah i if i were magnolia the first question that i would have about the lack of sleep because I'm getting not enough oxygen in my nose is like, well, maybe I should take this thing out of my nose. But that's just me. And I, of course, could be wrong. Sleep better now. Yeah. Get life changing sleep now. I would. A better CTA after you give social proof or give a bunch of testimonials might be something along of along the lines of like, uh, you know, see what other people are, you know, see why people are clamoring for hostage tape or something along those lines, you know, like have it be apropos or like appropriate given what people just saw. Mouth taping backed by your partner written a little confusingly. Have you been sleeping in the spare room because your partner can't stand your chainsaw snoring? Look, we all want peace and quiet. Put your hostage tape on your mouth and notice how you'll be a silent slumber. That's just written weird. Marriage is fixed. Ah, this is the first part of this copy where I'm just like, I I don't know if I would approach it this way. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, in terms of like rewriting this, I would... Uh, figure out a different way to approach this. Um, I think you have the right idea, uh, but all the words are wrong, to put it that way. CPAP-friendly mouth tape. By CPAP-friendly, do you mean like you won't need a CPAP, or do you mean like it works with a CPAP? Hmm. We'll make sure you... you, you Sleep through the whole night and wake up energized. Hostage tape is so comfortable that you'll even forget it's there. And don't worry about the suffering and pain of pulling your facial hair because it's simply not going to happen. I. Okay. But again, let's return and talk about believability and copy really quick. Um, if you, if I'm, if I'm talking to you and I'm saying like, Hey, you know, this painful thing that you're assuming will happen. Well, guess what? It won't happen. Will you believe me? I'm not so sure. You have to give something else there. Like, for example, if you said something along the lines of like, you know, our special neoprene adhesive ensures that it sticks to your skin, not to your hair, so that you never have to worry about the pain of pulling out hairs again. Well, then I'm just like, oh, shit, that's cool. You know, it, it feels believable. It feels real. And that's what I'm talking about here. So that's something you want to think about. You know, don't just say like, hey, this thing that you're worried about, it won't happen. Nobody's going to believe you. Hostage shape is made for you and your beard. Look, you could buy cheap tape. But for most of us with facial hair and strong jaws, it's just not going to hold. Hostage shape is... You're on the right track here. It's, you know, it's okay. Hostage tape is designed to have a firm hold and stay put. I guarantee that, that by the first, by the first night, do you mean after the first night? You'll be feeling way better. And beware of using duct tape. Unless you're a masochist beast, you'll rip your lips off and leave a nasty sticky residue. Um... A little aggressive, you know, it depends on the client. I'm not sure I would go in that particular direction, but uh, yeah. The, listen, the thing you need to do here, like everything in this first, uh, you know, few sections, you're doing okay. But for the most part, what I see you really needing is to go back through and really think, every single sentence. Am I saying what I want to say? Am I articulating things clearly? And am I saying this in the most powerful way that I possibly can? And that's, it's going to be tedious, but that's where this is now. And that's work that really like, 
that is going to make this better at this particular point. Because what you're doing, you know, you're showing a thing, you're making an implied promise, you know, you're showing the, you know, proof sort of of the benefit or like why you should believe that you can achieve this benefit. And then you're doing it again. And then you're reversing risk. Like you're doing all the things that good sales copy should do. What's going wrong here is the articulation of your ideas. That can be stronger. And that's what I would recommend you focus on. All right, let's move on to another thing really quick. Let's, oh boy. Oh boy. Yeah, we just have so much copy. I'm, I'm going to look at one more thing and then maybe next week we'll do another Whetstone Wednesday. And that, that's going to be it for me because like I do actually have work and like I'm sure you can tell that the quality of my comments decreases the longer that I stream. That's why usually at this point I just resort to talking about poop and butts and stuff. All right. We're looking at a card abandonment sequence for hostage tape. Uh, this is for the same person. So I want to switch it up and, and give advice to a different person. Um, Ryan L target audience. All right. I'm wondering what this is. Another email sample. Hi, Ryan. Who's Ryan? Another email sample for you to check out again. Blast it. If it works trash, if it doesn't, ah, I know what this is. John wrote this and basically wrote a free email for somebody to test. Okay, good. Target audience. Problem where people who want to make more money using R2SA, uh, I guess some sort of Airbnb system, and smoothly transition out of their 9 to 5. Okay. Idea for the email. Um, get readers to click on a link to go to the sales page. Therefore, email must only, only sell, click, and not the offer, which is a free webinar that is a masterclass. Cool. The emotion attitude to stir up is the desire to make more money using private investors, AKA other people's money. Unique angle is going to be based on the invention of the barcode. I'm intrigued. Offer this thing. Action, click CTA. Subject line, how to scale your Airbnb success like a new high demand invention. Um, I feel like the subject line, how to scale your Airbnb success is a stronger subject line than the thing in total. Where how to scale your Airbnb success lacks is in uniqueness and specificity. But I still think that's better than what you got going on. Why? Um, it's benefit driven. This kind of confuses me a little bit. Uh, this feels like something that I would want to know if I were in that world. Um, yeah, so those are all reasons why I would want to adjust that subject line. You can punch this up even more by making it more specific, but also go back to what I said earlier in the stream, which is like, you know, the optimal subject line is relatively short. Like here, I want to zoom in so everybody can see what I'm actually looking at. So optimal subject line is relatively short because again, you have a very limited amount of real estate in an email service provider. So that's something you want to consider. So these lengthy subject lines, I'm not saying that they don't work. Sometimes they do. But um, the shorter, the better. And by shorter, I don't mean like one word. I mean like you got like five or six, maybe seven words to really get somebody's interest with a subject line. So same thing with preview text. You got like this amount and that's it everything else just gets lopped off by the email service provider. And so that's something you got to keep in mind if you're doing email copy. Get this main factor correct and you will grow your Airbnb business in leaps, not steps. Get it wrong and you could... Why not just start with grow your Airbnb business in leaps, not steps. Get, it... Get this wrong and you could delay your success. You know, that feels more benefit driven than what this currently is. Body. Hey, first name. If you consider yourself more entrepreneurial than most people you know, then you might be missing an incredible opportunity to make more money than you intend. This opening is not working for me. Um, 
you know, it's not super disruptive. It's not super engaging or fascinating or interesting. It's sort of lacking. Um, you know, like, like if you consider yourself an entrepreneur, you know, that almost feels like a challenge. Like that's more interesting than like, than most people, you know, like, well, any entrepreneur is going to feel that way because most people are not entrepreneurs. So there you go. Then you might be missing an incredible opportunity to make more money than you intend. Well, everybody intends to make money. And so like, I don't, I don't know what you're trying to say there. Doesn't really, doesn't really compute. Did you know that the barcode invention was in existence for over 30 years before it blew up because of being adopted by big supermarkets like Walmart? Imagine this email started something along the lines of like, hey, first name. Did you know that there's a secret to one of the most, you know, uh, even better, even better. Dear, hey, first name. Do you know what one of the most successful sleeper inventions of all time is? Question mark. And then that sort of like allows you to segue into this intriguing story about the barcode. Um you want to build up some sort of fascination or like demand, like people want to know more about this. So the lesson for you here is this, you can't scale your Airbnb business unless you get the attention of private investors and get them to listen to what you have to say. You're building up a story to build up intrigue. And then you're immediately giving away the lesson. Go back to what I was saying in previous streams and earlier in this stream, gradualization. You want a steady, a long unzipping. You want gradual building up of intrigue. So that's necessary there. This feels like, it's like, hey, do you want to know this fascinating secret? Well, here it is. And then you just say it. Like, give it some time to marinate a little bit. Not too much time, but just a little bit. And they have to believe that you are the one who can make the money while you make a chunk of it too. Can you imagine? Yeah, here's the thing. And I think you want to approach this a little bit differently. And the way that you would want to approach this is you would want to say, you know, like, give a list of inventions and ask a reader, like, you know, all of these, you know, have created multi-million or multi-billion dollar businesses what do they all have in common? It's not this. It's not this. It's not this. It's not whatever you're thinking of. No. All these inventions or all these businesses or whatever, they scaled to this amount of money because they use the secret of OPM. What's OPM, you ask? Well, it's only the secret that basically allows you to leverage every single dollar you have, you have and turn it possibly into this, this, or this. And then you would include bigger numbers than one. Most people don't understand how to use OPM and you know, things like that. And what you're doing, and I'm going to stop giving you free copy right there. Um, what you're doing by doing it that way is you're building up a, some sort of innate desire or demand to learn about what OPM actually is. And that way, by the time that you get to the end of the email, you can reveal that it's other people's money. And you can talk about how like, and in this presentation, I actually show you how to get it, how to raise it, how to employ it to multiply your wealth in some sort of time frame. Click here to find more information. That's all you need to do. You build intrigue, you build desire for like the reveal of one idea. Once people like learn that idea, well, now people want to know, well, how do they use and execute that idea? And then you immediately come in with like, that's all available here just beyond this click. So that's how I would rewrite this email. Okay, I think my brain is broken. My voice is sore. Does anybody have any like questions for me before I go and disappear? Because I think that's all I can really manage for the rest of the evening. I think that's what I got. Uh, I've I've given you all that I can. <laughs> Anybody have anything else? I'm wondering if like 
people are watching but it's like glitching like people have like like walked away from the computer and it's just it's saying 20 but it's like it's actually nobody like i'm just speaking to the void just talking to myself again like i always do when i'm naked and sweating and wondering about what people desire hmm anyway good night thank you for joining for this particular stream i hope you got something out of it i hope you learned a lot and uh yeah if you would like to submit your copy or review on one of these buck wild streams uh go to patreon.com slash the copy that show um sign up and you can either email or go onto our discord and post up there and yeah hold on i got a got a comment in general <laughs> we are not alone uh yeah it's just uh, maybe the 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 chat feed is no longer coming in so I have no idea. Either way, uh, take care. Have a wonderful night. I will see you soon. Go make some money.